The following announcement has been paid for by the New World Order. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Y'all ready for this? And now, coming to you live from MainEventMadness.com and brought to you by Spreaker, it's Main Event Madness. Our wrestling, your sports, simply madness. And on that note, here's your hosts, Al Merriman and John Curry. Ladies and gentlemen, this is episode number one of Main Event Madness with your host Alfonso Marmon and my partner in crime, John Curry. How the hell are you today? Fired up. Let's do this. We're starting all over again. Only it bigger, better, great. We have an awesome, awesome, awesome show. Absolutely. And we got all right, guys. So. Oh, so ahead. this is the first step. I know um, this is our first episode, Main Event Madness. Uh, same two crazy mofos from Wrestling Three Six Five. Uh, it is Main Event Madness. We got a new format, a new website, MainEventMadness.com. Uh, that's going to be your source to listen to us live. We have a chat room set up. Check it out. We got a pretty cool logo and a pretty awesome website. We're supporting. Uh, it is October, so we are supporting. Uh, we've gone pink on the website and all of our websites pretty much and Twitter accounts, including including WrestlingNews.net, uh, Wrestling-News.net, I'm sorry, and uh, WrestlingNewsReport.com. We're all pink um, in hopes of bringing awareness to breast cancer. So we, and we have something later on we're going to talk about with Susan G. Coleman, and I've entitled it The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly uh, for... A couple things, and and you'll find out later. I'm going to give you guys the facts, and uh, I'm going to let you guys decide if you should give uh, towards the uh, charity or not. But my goal is to bring um, awareness. I have a mom. uh, A lot of people have dealt with uh, uh, breast cancer. So you guys got to go out there, check it out. Um, Do your, what what is it? I forgot what it's called right now. Get out there, get your mammograms checked. Mammogram, thank you. Don't be afraid to do it. You gotta get. We want you guys to carry those for as long as possible. All right. So exactly, you need to be here to listen to Main Event Madness each week. Bottom line: (laughs) get out there, get yourself checked. Make sure you're you're keeping yourselves healthy. Make sure you're being on the forefront of this, and you're making sure that you're catching it in time. That you guys still can live on, prosper, and of course, listen to Main Event Madness every week. That's right, folks. So, Main Event Madness, I just want to let you guys know, we, and I, I love it. I love our, our slogan, right? So, it's all wrestling, your sports, and it's simply madness. So, we're combining it all, folks. We're going to talk about all wrestling. We're going to talk about your sports. Mix it up. We have a great format, a great lineup. We have uh, William Barons or Bill Barons, uh, uh, known by the most of you. He's um, he's an independent booker, and he and he has a lot of clients, including AJ Styles. Um, I believe he's just got Ezekiel Jackson. I mean, the list goes on and on. The Hardy, I, he has a lot of people that he's represented throughout the, these years, and he'll be on the show to talk about his experiences. So please, uh, if you have an event coming up or or anything like that, visit visit SBI Bookings, sbibookings.com, and um, he has a list of all of the people that he um, um, – Represents and he, he's a great guy. We're gonna have him on, on the show uh, on our at the end of the hour, pretty much here around. So he'll be on the show a little bit later, guys. About an hour and a half from now. An hour and a half. Sorry, I got my my eye. And, and before we continue, this is a very interesting show. We're all going through a lot of crazy stuff today. For some reason, October first for a lot of us is a crazy day uh, for all these uh, different uh, reasons. Uh, that you know, personal reasons, but my personal reason is my eyeball, my eye is swollen and it keeps on getting bigger. It, I woke up to a swollen eye and 
I'm starting to notice that my eyesight is like starting to get a little bit messed up. So right after the show, I will be going to urgent care and I'll give you all an update because I'm freaking out here. So bear with me if, I, if I'm getting times and, and numbers wrong, but I usually do that anyways. It's just a part of me. But, uh, well, October 1st is bad for you. October 2nd is going to be a little tricky for me. My grandmother, um, I don't want to say ironic enough, but, um, my grandmother is going in for a double mastectomy tomorrow for breast cancer. So, so October 1st is bad for you because you, uh, you have one eye right now and October 2nd is bad for me. Yeah, and we'll pray for you. I have a strong feeling she'll be okay. We're going to pray for her and that everything goes well and, and, um, you know, keep us posted with that. That's why it's very important this month. You know, it's just, it's cool that they have a month dedicated to bring awareness, uh, to breast cancer. So, um, like you said, you know, this could hit anybody, anybody's family. It's hit my family, um, John. So it's just important, you know, uh, ladies get checked out. We have a huge show to, today, guys. We're going to be talking about glo uh, Global Force Wrestling. It's first eye pay-per-view. Uh, we're talking about the Road to the World Series, which uh, John's going to enlighten us on that. We're going to talk a little bit about the NBA. We have Randy Orton's future plans of going into WrestleMania 31. Uh, we're going to have... Yes, I know. I know. It's going to be a tough one if the reports are true. Then we're going to break down Bray Wyatt, Luke Carpenter, and Eric Rowan. What the hell happened to the Wyatt family? That's going to be a big uh, they got a topic blown apart. discussion That's later. what happened. Say that again, sir? They got blown apart last night. That's what happened. That's what happened. Yeah, and yeah, it's just it's it's a sad uh, thing, and I think uh, you know we're going to break it down a little bit later. Uh, when it comes to that, I just feel like they um, definitely uh, dropped the ball literally on that. So let's get right into it. We got some independent news here uh, with uh, Double J, Jeff Jarrett. And I wanted to talk a little bit about Global Force Wrestling right. and um, their future. And they just had a, a, a pretty big announcement. And it's not 100,000% confirmed. I'll say it's 99% confirmed. That's but a it's drop looking off like. Half there, man. 100,000% to 99%. Uh, there you go. There That's you go. I mean, I, I know it sounds bad, but <laughs> I, <I'm laughs> uh, but it looks like Global Force Wrestling is going to finally hold an eye pay per view event. Now, I, I tell you this. This is I wanted to kind of break it down to you guys. So apparently, what's happening is that he's they're going to be hosting a New Japan's uh, pay per view or a show and put Global Force Wrestling name attached to it and selling it as Global Force Wrestling. Uh, essentially, you know, bringing New Japan Wrestling uh, to the States or online with the iPay-Per-View. He did say that it was going to be different. I just did not see this type of difference. I thought he was going to have his own roster. I'm wondering if he's made all these connections with all these territories around the world already, and it literally is around the world. I mean, Africa, Canada, um, Japan. He's made all these connections with these these organizations, and I'm thinking that he's possibly thinking of just holding his eye pay per views there, using their talent, and just slapping his name on it. So I don't know if he, I don't know if he's planning on having an actual roster, and I don't know if he's just doing his eye pay per view events just to get his name out there and start off small. Well, what is your take? Well, do you think that I'm reading too much into this? Because I don't remember the last time I've ever seen a promotion kind of slap their name on something um, like Double, uh, Double J's doing here. I mean, that's it's definitely interesting because we all thought when Global Force Wrestling was announced that it was going to be a company rivaling TNA, rivaling WWE and Ring of Honor, and it was going to be another alternative. But as the news has trickled out over the last, I don't know, what, six months or so since... Uh, or Global Force, bleh, Global Force Wrestling was announced. Um, it's kind of more like it's like you just said it. They're gonna just uh, have shows like that, and they're just gonna slap the GFW name on it, which is which is different because, like, you, I I don't really know. I don't really know how people would react to that because you know everybody wants their own promotion, and you never really had somebody that it's like they're not exactly a pay per view distributor. Or would it be like their distributor? It's just like they're. 
it'd be like WWE promoting uh, a WCW pay per view or something like that. I don't, I don't really. Uh, yeah, it's kind of weird, you know. I, he definitely did say it would be different, so I mean, it would be different. And he always said that it, you know, he wanted to get all this great mix of talent or or, or, or showcase it. Yeah, it'd be like. Uh, like uh, it, it worries me. I, it, not that it worries me. I was expecting a new wrestling company. So I think I we know, all had our hopes say, up, and we all were all excited for that next uh, WCW esque company to be there because TNA, in that regard, has let a lot of people down, and that people are tired of WWE being the only name in the or in the game. And once Jeff Jarrett left TNA and had all this momentum behind it, we all got excited. Oh, this is finally going to be it. This is finally going to be a number two. Eh, not really. And, and, and here's the thing. Let, let's say, John, his plan is still to be an alternative to the WWE, TNA, and even Ring of Honor for that, that matter. Okay. Let's say that is still his goal and he's going to have a full-fledged roster. I don't know if this would be a great business decision on his end to attach his name to a, a different wrestling product if it's not really going to be his product. You, you, it, does that make sense? So let's say it, does, it is true what we've read, and this iPay-Per-View is going to be New Japan booking, um, and he is attaching his name to that, and in the United States, he's going to sell his product to us as Global Force Wrestling, but it, it's New Japan um um, style booking, and then six months later, three months later, he says, well, now I got a roster, and I got my own uh, roster. I don't know if that's good business decision making. You know, I don't know if that's going to be great for him, and, and and I don't know if he's trying to rush it too fast. Look, he, had a, he has a huge buzz. He left TNA, and he jumped right into Global Force Wrestling. Mm -hmm. He's been, he has his website. He's got 10,000, 20,000, whatever it is on social media, 100,000 on his Twitter and on Facebook, around 20 something thousand for Global Force, whatever the case is. And he's made all these connections. I just feel like it may have, it, it's probably too fast. But I, I mean, I don't know. We got to see this thing play out. It might be the best thing we've ever seen. It just seems like he's taking it. A different approach where we thought it was going to be a third uh, company or fourth, fifth, you know, company in the states, and and uh, he was going to bring talent. Well, my my idea was that he was going to bring talent from around the world into the states, and he was going to have one of the craziest talent pools known on this this wrestling planet because it's not you know at that and all these different styles and and stuff like that. So it. That's what I still want to see. I don't want to see him put his name on a different wrestling pro pro uh, promotion and then do it again the next month and then do it again the next month. I, I really didn't want to see it. I wanted to the, see a nice mix of talent. Especially with some of the free agents that are out there right now wrestling-wise. Rob Van Dam's out there. You know, you never know the rate things are going. Christian might be out there pretty soon. Bully Ray's out there. Kurt Angle's out there. Um, RBD isn't. What do you mean? His contract's up. Um, uh, RVD is um, definitely a WWE guy. Um, I mean, I, I I'd be remiss if I didn't say him CM Punk, but let's say he's uh he's he's retired, but I mean he's still free agent ultimately. So uh, well, let me tell you this, John. Not even that; those talents, those, those faces would be good to draw some more attention to your company. But I'm talking about the talents that you and I don't even know. They're exactly. pre CM Punks. They're pre Daniel Bryan's. You know the the pre the pre Michael Algens, the pre Jay Briscoes, like the guys we don't know of that are in these different countries. That's what I wanted to see. I wanted to see something unique, what I've never seen before. I wanted to see different styles from people I don't even know. I wanted I wanted to grow and become a fan of unknown names, kind of like what they're doing with NXT in a sense. That's what I thought. GF, I thought GFW was going to be a mix of some known talent with impeccably great young talented people from around the globe mixed together almost like that cruiserweight division used to be in a wcw era mm -hmm. where it was a nice you i wanted to see that cruiserweight division in action back raw, in the day raw talent raw undiscovered talent guys who never really had a chance to shine yet and, and look at look at some of the talent that came out of that yeah dean malenko chris jericho way mysterio jr the ultimate dragon i mean the list goes on and on of all the different people people that came out 
um, of that cruiserweight division in WCW. And they still, most of them are making a name for themselves. Chris Jericho definitely is. He's just a, a crazy talent-wise. Uh, but that's what I wanted to see. I wanted to see something different. New. And, and, and I'm not saying that it's not going to happen. That uh, Global Force Wrestling may still be that. Um, I think that, that Double J is having a tougher time than he thought he would. And um, and I'm, I'm saying getting that TV deal and launching and the cost. Maybe that's what's going on. I know he has some private investors as well. It's just he wanted um, – well, we'll see. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and bash, bash it for any reason. I want to see it play out. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I, I, I don't know what it is. I want to see what, how it plays out. And um, it should be – it's an exciting time. I'm happy for Jeff Jarrett, and I'm happy that there's going to be a different choice for me to watch wrestling. And I just want to see it play out. And I do hope it becomes another uh, great company. Um, and, and I want it to be based out of, out of the United States. You know, I want a good, strong um, – If at the very least comp- – if it's for our international company, at least hopefully it's on a network that we could see it. And that's yeah, just like an internet And if not, they'll be stuck to IP reviews. You know, we'll, we'll all be able to see that for maybe nine ninety nine. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> ah, you're calling me out on that. <laughs> and I don't have it up right now. Oh, man. But, guys, this is Alfonso Marimont with John Curry. It's. That, that's oh, good. That's fine. Hey, um, yeah, yeah, main yeah. Event Madness, our debut show. I'm sorry? It is our debut show, Main Event Madness, which just happens to be taking place on... Pump Day! Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> our favorite Woo! day of the week, folks. Pump Day! Alright, guys, so we're back here. We're talking a little bit about it, Global Force Wrestling, how the fact that they're putting their, their name on a New Japan product or, you know... Uh, next month or in January, I'm sorry. So here's another company doing the same thing, which is a bigger company, which is they have no excuse to do this. And then we're going right into TNA wrestling here uh, before we continue on with the show. So it's they're pretty much doing the same thing, and, and there's a reason for that. So when, when Jeff Jarrett was with TNA, he cut a deal with those folks over in New Japan. And... Um, and, and, and this has been in place for a while, if you guys haven't read the reports, that TNA Wrestling is taking a, back, a step back in a production of Bound for Glory pay-per-view. This is a real facepalm here, honestly. Just the, just the <laughs> decision-making that's going into this. I mean, it's the equivalent of WWE going to another company and saying, hey, go ahead, book WrestleMania for us. Uh, having ROH come in and, uh, hey, uh, go, go do No, let alone that it's in a different country, different mindset, different everything. They had a lot of momentum going with that, too, because nobody, none of the major companies that I know of have ever had um, their biggest shows of the year outside of the country, let alone in Japan. So with that, that was a, a, a nice, it was a, at least in my opinion, it was a fresh announcement. It was something different. And TNA had a little bit of momentum with it. And they had the stretch back in the early summer of the good or good tapings they had. With the, or was it the New York City tapings, I think it was? Did a good stretch. They had a little bit of momentum going. And then the, it just evaporated. And, and it's sad. And what, it what frustrates me is that I'm reading reports that, that apparently... The uh, management um, for TNA's TNA's management at this time, they're more concerned about their TV deal expiring and, and getting that done than their yearly pay per view. Well, I understand that they're in a high alert over there at headquarters in Nashville, Tennessee. But the the problem is that that your bound for glory pay per view is your Super Bowl, and it has been. Even though it's a small Super Bowl and it's near the Arena League, it's a huge deal for you guys to give up total control and I only have about ten percent of your roster on that pay per view. It's mind boggling to me, and I don't understand it. It is simply madness uh, to stay in our <laughs> in our ah, theme here. Um, it, it just doesn't make sense, guys. I, I don't understand it, and it kind of bothers me. Um, that they're playing, they're putting it on the on their on their second tier priorities. But on the other hand, I'll tell you this: I believe that 
Bound for Glory pay-per-view will be worth watching. I believe the wrestling on that pay-per-view is going to be the best thing you've seen in years. There might not be any core storylines. There might not be anything like that, but you, I think we'll, we'll be able to see a wrestling pay-per-view, whatever the cost is, because, I, I mean, I know it's out of the wall zoo here with the cost of that pay-per-view, but I feel if New Japan is putting on this show, they know how to put on wrestling matches. And we may not know Yakamata Giba versus whatever, whatever, whatever the names are. Wrestler A versus Wrestler B. We might not know them here in the States, but I guarantee you, we might not need to see a storyline built to it. They're going to have some great wrestling matches, and the matches will tell the story itself. And I think we might see a little bit of old school wrestling at this Bound for Glory pay per view, and it might be a delightful uh, pay per view to watch. I, for one, want to see how it plays out. Um, we're always talking about TNA storylines being bland. Well, they deleted that from this pay per view, so it might be an awesome pay per view, folks. <laughs> but it's still weird that the the TNA's biggest show of the year isn't going to have any of their real marquee stars, any of their championships. I mean, if you're building your WrestleMania, your Super Bowl, you want your company's crown jewel to be on the line, at least I would think. And, yeah, I mean, it's not going to happen. Yeah, I mean, it, it is, that's one of those strange things um, that, that that is not happening, that, you know, the major titles aren't going to be defended. None of them and, are going to uh, be defended. I'm sorry? Yeah, none of them none are. Of them. And, and, and uh, it's one of those things that I also read that the, the Japan wrestling fans don't like to be um, deceived, right? They, they, they don't like to know that, that you guys got to remember that this is a TNA spoiler alert. So if you want to mute for half a second here. Spoiler <laughs> alert. Yeah, we might have to get an audio clip for that. But <laughs> the time, the World Heavyweight Championship for TNA did change hands in their tapings. And it happens after the Bound for Glory or before the Bound for Glory. I don't even know. Uh, oh, technically, it happens after the Bound for Glory pay-per-view. So, technically, Bobby Lashley would have to be at Bound for Glory as champion, I think. It's a, it's a cluster F. All right? So, that's pretty much just to say the least. So, the fans apparently in Japan do not like to be deceived or be called stupid when you bring a champion into, the, into, their, home, into their hometown that is not really a champion because he already lost the title. So... Kind of like what WWE does to his fans sometimes, and, and and they think that we forget everything all the time. It's kind of the the concept there. They don't like to to be uh, belittled and be called stupid. Kind of like what Vince McMahon does but a lot why to his fans. The, but why wouldn't the title changes be allowed to take place there? I mean, they don't. Do they not like seeing new champions? I mean, that's one of the most it's, exciting parts of pro wrestling. It's not that the title change not be the the problem is that the title change already happened. Now, if you bring a, pay, a, a person over, um, uh, if you, it's the, the only problem is that the title change happened. That's the problem. Now, if you build up a, a big match, they're going to want to see it. Like, if it was Bobby Lashley's, Lashley versus Bobby Roode or, or whatever the case is, because that's probably would have been their big match, um, and no, no title changes happen, okay, come over here and, and let's fight for the title and wrestle for the title. But it's not like that. The problem is that that title changed already. They will want to see a championship match, but but um, it's just the way that everything booked these 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 teaming tapings really screwed TNA. They were trying to save on cost and all that, but I think it really ended up biting them in the in, Wait, in the so, butt. Oh, so uh, was there tapings? Like this is how far behind on the TNA stuff I am. Like they. So what they're, did they're, they? They're scheduled all the way up until um, the end of the year right now. <laughs> the, the, yeah, yeah, it's crazy. And then, and then towards the end of the back end of the year, like November, December, those last three to four weeks, they're going to be um, doing a special. Like, um, you you might not have any new content on the show. They're going to do like a series of best ofs, closing out the year. Damn. Exactly. <laughs> exactly it, it, it's unbelievable 
sad, but hey, I, I, I just can't believe it. So let's just pray that they could get a TV deal. At heart, we are wrestling fans, you know, and we love to see different products out there. And uh, this just doesn't look good, guys. A decision Teenage like this is not helping their chances of making them not look Bush League right now, and that's exactly hmm. how they look. Definitely. And, and, you know, I hate being so negative, so here's a positive spin on it. They're still bringing in about a million um, viewers each week. So, I mean, if I own the uh, WGN or, or one of these networks, hey, that's an extra million people that I'm getting into my network. You know, at least, at least let's say 800 or 700,000 people follow TNA over. It's a nice jump. So they still have that chance. Because right now, GFW ain't pulling on one million anything. So, so TNA, you know, they have a small brand there that could, they could build on. And um, it just sucks, the mismanagement of the company and, and, and the loss of all these great players. And, and we've gone through the list a million times. You guys all know. And I know a lot of people don't want to hear about TNA, but we need to get it out there. Let you guys know what's going on in our wrestling industry. And, um, and I think it's... It's just simply madness what's going on with TNA wrestling. And I, I think I glory. can speak for a lot of people when they let out a collective. Damn! Nah, we, we do that in unison. Uh, all of us together give it a big old damn. So that's, damn. Uh, that, that's where we're at. Folks, this is uh, Fonzo Merriman and John Curry, our first ep episode of uh, Main Event. Uh, almost, almost first episode our, of Main Event Madness. Uh, main Event Madness. Uh, please visit MainEventMadness.com. We have a chat room up. And the auto player is on there as well. If you're listening to us on Spreaker, uh, check out the website. It's pretty, uh, pretty uh, well put together. John and I worked a lot on it. We have the archives slowly but surely from Wrestling 365 are going to be appearing on the website. Um, so you're going to be able to listen to our interviews from Diamond Isles Page, Bruno San Martino back in the Wrestling 365 days, Tyler Rex, the list goes on. We have interviews lined up for the next month or so, I believe, right now. Uh, we got Bill Burns today. We, we'll have a couple commercials. Uh, former TNA knockout, former WWE Diva uh, will be on next week. We have... Um, Jim Barcelona, we have somebody that wrote a wrestling lo love novel, should be a very interesting interview, and we'll have a couple other things lined up as well, so that's going to be coming up in the next month, we have a bunch of great stuff, and um, let's continue on, we're going now into the sports realm, and this is, I'm going to let you guys know as of right now, our first episode of Main Event Madness, John, John, you are our baseball guru. So, this is your segment of the show, and I, and I I I felt that you know this week with Major League Baseball, the biggest story, um, even though it's the beginning of the road to the World Series, is the fact of Derek Jeter. Actually, you know, yeah, he's he's done. It's very sad. It's a, one of the, Derek Jeter to me is one of those. Um, Baseball players that reminded me of the old school, you know, the, how baseball it used to be, how it I mean. should still be, and how it should be going forward. And that's the only hope that I had that Major League Baseball would be America's sport again, was Derek Jeter. You know, like, he, he, he was, is a baseball player, and what a baseball player should be, I think. And I hate the Yankees. <laughs> so I was just putting it out there, Derek Jeter... I thank you for all the entertainment, for busting your butt. I enjoyed watching you, even though you were a Yankee. And uh, I know we got a special tribute um, that I think uh, John has queued up here. Yep. Uh, sorry, I was in the middle of a good stretch there. <laughs> Getting all refreshed. And now the end is near. And so I face. Final curtain. You know what? My friend, I'll walk from here. I'll say it clear. I'll no. state my case. Sound is going. Who's winning? Leon! Hey! Leon! 
This is Stan. We've been waiting for you to come in here since 98 at the least. You never invited me. <laughs> We're here now. Thank you. I'm signing this old man. All right. Captain. You doing all right, buddy? Yeah, that's <laughs> great. Captured your spirit. Hello. <laughs> I'm older. I don't know these things. Me either. Get there! What is a man? What has he got? If not himself, then he has not to say the things he truly feels, and not the words of one who kneels. The record shows I took the blow and did it. As a Yankee fan and as a fan of Jeter's for the last, you know, I didn't really start watching the Yankees until about 12 years ago. Um, wasn't really big into sports, so I got a little bit older. Um, gives you goosebumps. And, you know, if you saw the commercial, um, it was Derek Jeter walking through the Bronx, seeing a bunch of his, of his fans, and then basically the fans and everybody just, like, following him to the Bronx and just showing their respect and their admiration for Derek Jeter, the captain of the Yankees. A lot of people uh, call him the captain of, or not a lot of people, it was uh, Bryce Harper of the Washington Nationals actually called Derek Jeter um, the captain of baseball. And a lot of people, this is what I was going to add, a lot of people are saying Derek Jeter was the face of baseball for the last 20 years and is the last face of baseball. You don't really have a lot of marquee players, a lot of big players that are, you know, that are just such quality people, quality athletes. I mean, all of them, they're um, they're just, I don't know, they're, they, they get in, like, the NFL, you get all these people that get in more trouble, that just let the fame go to their head, and you don't really get people that can handle the stardom, the fame, and everything like Derek Jeter did, and as well as he did. He never said, said anything wrong, he never embarrassed the Yankees, he never did anything wrong, and it's just crazy to see that the last 20 years went by so quickly, and you know... A lot of people from my generation that all we know with the Yankees are Der is Derek Jeter. And now to see the Yankees going into the future, it it's almost a scary time thinking, oh, what next? But and what is your what what is one of your like most memorable moments in seeing him play? Actually, it's kind of funny you mention that because I have the clip uh, queued up here. It was uh, from 2004. It was the Boston Red Sox playing the New York Yankees at Yankee Stadium. It was in the 13th inning, or 12th inning, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, it was right when the rivalry started to pick back up again and then kind of died down a couple years later. But this is probably one of my, or probably my favorite play by him. One, two. He loops that to left field. Going to be a tough play. Jeter on the run. Makes the play. Wow. And flies into the stands. Oh, what a play by Derek Jeter. Wow. wow. So, for those of you who may not be baseball fans, and Al may not even know of that play, um, shortstop here on the middle of the left side of the infield. He ran to the or to uh, short left field and actually w caught a fly ball and ran headfirst into the into the stands after catching the ball. So, uh, oh yeah, I remember that one. All right, yeah, they played that a couple times. I'll tell you what, I think that it was pretty special. His last game in Yankee Stadium. I mean, goosebumps just to, just I mean storybook ending. Oh yeah, absolutely. It, it, unbelievable. I, I mean, I, 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 I didn't see. I don't know what was wrong with me. That there was too much sports happening that night. I had to see it on like a replay. Um, but I got goosebumps watching the replay. I was like, "This is awesome. This is what sports is about." And um, you know, some guys that could write their own story, and he was able to do that. 
you know, which is pretty cool. I mean, there's some guys that are able to retire after winning a, a Super Bowl or, or, you know, this was a special thing, uh, the way that that game ended. I just thought it was awesome. And, um, you know, moving from Derek Jeter, because, I mean, that's hard to move on from. We do have the road to the, you know, World Series. And what a game last night. Oakland and Kansas City. What a City. game. What a game. Unbelievable. 12 innings. Unbelievable. 12 innings, 9 or nine eight. the Royals over the A's. And now we go from the American League to the National League. We got the Giants and the Pirates tonight. Excuse me. Edison Volquez pitching for the Pirates. We got Madison Bumgarner. Two of the top pitchers in the National League. Arguably the top pitchers for both of these teams going head-to-head -to -head tonight. And, I mean... As if last night's pitching matchup wasn't a good enough game. The guys didn't really pitch to where they should have pitched. But it's John Lester for the A's and James Shields for the, the Royals, two of the top pitchers in baseball. Um, they didn't quite pitch as, as good as I thought it did. I thought it would be more of a pitcher's duel than more of a, a homer fest. Or not even a homer fest, but a run fest like it turned out to be. You know, eight nine eight game after 12 innings. But... These two, the wild card teams, they go, they advance to face, be Washington and who is it going to be? Washington and who are they? Um, trying to figure out who they're playing. Oh, Los Angeles. I'm sorry, the, the top seeds. So Al, you haven't been following baseball as much, but I mean, if you've been looking at anything, do you have any team that you're kind of rooting for to go towards the uh, World Series? Or I, I'm t I tell you what, you know, it's hard to be a, a Miami fan right now with all of our. Listen, sports, I'm learning. Uh, I'm learning what it's Miami, like. Uh, Marlins, but I'm learning what it's like the last couple of years. You know, the Yankees haven't been in the playoffs since 2012. Yeah, and and you know what? At least you guys are trying to make it to the playoffs. I mean, we have the worst owners, uh, I think, in the history. Compared yeah, to Oakland Jeff Raiders, Gloria, we're, we're like right in line with Oakland Raiders. Um, but you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna root for the underdog. I'm going for the Royals. I mean, I, I love that type of story. And um, you know, they haven't been there since what, what was 1984. They haven't been in the playoffs for year until this year for your entire existence. Exactly. So so you know that's something that uh, that's awesome, and I root for them. Um, and then that's all I got to say. I mean, I, I haven't followed baseball. In so long, I boycotted baseball because of my team. I yeah, know last year. Really I mean, help. I didn't even see one game for the first time in my entire life of my Marlins. I used to see them all the time, and it's just it, it's gone that bad. I'm not the only fan down here in Miami uh, that that feels that way. And and now you know with with main event madness, I'm gonna I'm getting back into it um, just because. So I mean, that's mine. But realistic, realistically. Uh, John, who do you think has the best shot of winning? I mean, all? if you go based on the records, then you got to think the Nationals and the Los Angeles Angels. I mean, the two of them had the two best records in baseball. The Dodgers are right there. They got Clayton Kershaw, and then they got the who undoubtedly will be the NL Cy Young Award winner, and uh, Clayton Kershaw, twenty-one and three. Al, that's that's like that's scary good. 21 and 3, 21 wins, 3 losses, and doesn't even allow 2 runs per 9 innings. That's what an earned run average, for those of you who don't know, has a 177 earned run average, which is just scary good because you don't see numbers like that anymore. You haven't really seen numbers like that since, God, the 70s, Ron Guidry. And, uh, I, I would not want to play him. I mean, it'd be kind of interesting to see it come down to the Battle of uh, Los Angeles, Dodgers and the Angels playing each other. I I respect the Baltimore Orioles. They they won the division that my Yankees are in. Um, I, I respect what they've done. They have a good team this year. I don't really care for the team too much, nor the Tigers, so I'm not really worrying about that. Um, yeah, I... I I'm kind of rooting for it to be Nationals and the Los Angeles Angels this year. Those two teams I kind of respect, kind of like, pretty good. Nationals got a lot of young players. Steven Strasburg, uh, Bryce Harper, Ryan Zimmerman, uh, Jordan Zimmerman. So, yeah, they got a, they got a good core people. And I know, uh, so I know I'm mean, kind it of be, It's going to be a lot of great baseball. If any indication was that game last night. So exactly. We kind we'll, of feel like we'll I'm talking. Be, uh, talking about it um, along the way throughout the entire 
I uh, feel like for, it's a real for you and especially for Wayne, I kind of feel like I'm talking in French. You guys have German subtitles on. Oh. <laughs> I love that. All right, let's continue on here. That's our um, Major League Baseball talk uh, with your guru, John Curry. I'm calling him a guru. I don't know if that's a yeah, good that's thing. Yeah, that's all right. Anybody <laughs> wants to talk talk baseball with me, you know, we've got some plans coming up this winter. We might do a uh, – a, an off-season show for baseball. Just talk some rumors, maybe like once a month or something like that. Try to collect up the best rumors that are going around. Um, but yeah, you're listening to the first ever ep- episode of Main Event Madness. We are live, maineventmadness.com, Spreaker.com. I hate this link, but we can't change it. Spreaker.com slash Wrestling365. TuneIn.com, search Main Event Madness. Stitcher.com slash podcast slash Wrestling365. And search Main Event Madness on iHeart whenever they actually decide they want to upload us. Oops, did I just take a shot? I think I did. I think you may have, but it's okay. Oh, I, I guess what, guys? we got new Twitter handles. Yes, we and, do. Um, I've been going back and forth, and I don't know if I, I should change it back. I, I but <laughs> as of this moment... I'm Al Me Madness. I don't know if that's <laughs> right or wrong, but that's what I'm using. <laughs> and then if you want an easier one or one that's not as... I don't really know what what to call that. You can follow me on Twitter if you haven't already. It's at, uh, at John M-E-M Radio. So I'm Al Me Madness. I might have to change that. Well, I might have to do a vote later and see what's best. Your, your thing is reminding me, I don't know why, but of the uh, one of Jericho's first promos when he came back those years ago. Me want title uh, match. Uh, <laughs> I'll organize it for you. <laughs> uh, there you go. Uh, it does actually remind me of that. I'm going to have to change it. All right, folks. Well, as of now, just follow me there, and uh, when it changes, it changes. But I do believe uh, we, we got a commercial break coming up, Al, if I'm not mistaken here. Yes, I think, yeah. Yes, we do. All right, guys, so we're going to take a quick commercial break here. We'll be back in a minute or two. Coming up, we got a very interesting segment, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly with the Susan G. Komen Foundation. Um, also, speaking of Randy Orton, that was a little bit of a teaser coming up also. Some news on Randy Orton going into WrestleMania 31. And, you know, we're giving predictions on the World Series. You know what? We got predictions. It's never too early. It's October 1st. You know what's starting up this month? Basketball. The NBA is back later this month. We're going to take a commercial break. We'll be back in a couple minutes. We've got a loaded show coming up in the second half here on Main Event Madness. And that's it. We'll be right back. Hey, you. Yeah, you. Looking for quality wrestling news with an international flair? Looking for results and news from around the world? Look no further than Wrestling-News.net. Wayne Daly and his crew have you covered from top to bottom, from WWE to TNA to the top independent companies from around the world. Check them out. Wrestling-News.net. Looking for more than your average wrestling website? Looking for the fastest growing wrestling news site on the internet today? With quality news, results, and more. Wrestling News Report has everything you'd want in a wrestling website. Al Merriman has you covered with the latest and biggest stories of the day from all around the world of pro wrestling. Check them out today, WrestlingNewsReport.com. So you're cruising around the internet looking for some entertainment. What if I told you there's a hard-hitting, fresh, and opinionated podcast out there covering everything from WWE and TNA to the NFL, the NBA, and MLB? Well, that's reality. Main Event Madness is here. Don't miss us every week on MainEventMadness.com as well as on TuneIn Radio and Stitcher.com. Main Event Madness. Our wrestling. Your sports. Simply Madness. Hear that? That music used to instill fear in women around the world, and now it instills excitement as former WWE diva and TNA knockout Amazing Kong is coming to Main Event Madness. 
Join us October 6th for a special Monday edition of Main Event Madness live from 1230 to 2 p.m. Eastern on Spreaker.com slash Wrestling365. folks we are back here on main event madness this is our first edition here we are live main event madness.com spreaker.com slash wrestling 365 tune in.com search main event madness iheart.com search wrestling 365 main event madness i i doubt they've even uploaded those or stitcher.com slash podcast slash wrestling 365 we're there and also we're live wrestling-news.net wrestlingnewsreport.com you guys want to check out your wrestling news for the day? You guys want to check out? There's a couple older columns on there on wrestling-news.net. You want to check those out? I believe Al's got a column or two up on his site also. You guys want to check out some columns, some news? Why not listen to wrestling, or excuse me, to Main Event Madness. That's almost a force of habit there, guys. Um, why not check out Main Event Madness, our debut show right now? But, yeah, we got a loaded show. We got Bill Barron's coming in about 45 minutes from now. We've got... As you heard in the, that last commercial, we got Karma on October 6th. We've got Jim Varslone next week. We've got, um, um, Al, help me out here. Uh, um, we have a bunch of writers. we got Matt Hancock, which he is um, mm-hmm. Diamond Dallas Page, um, right-hand man. Uh, he's doing a lot of workshops with him, uh, with DDP Yoga. So he's going to be on the show. We're going to have him after all of that. We have a gentleman, and, and, and I wish, I'm, you know how I am with pronouncing names. Uh, you guys all gave me scrap about Kikio Naka, Kiyoko say, Nakamata. Um, gonna, what yeah, is Nakamata, Kiyoko, whatever Kikyo I said. Nakamura? But this gentleman's name is Lee T. Lunsford, and what? he um, wrote one of the first ever wrestling love novels. So we're going to have him on the show talk about his experience. He has two more novels coming up. You can find it on Barnes and Noble, uh, dot com, and Amazon. It's um everywhere, and it's called a a Rody Pinto Rody Pinto Love. That's off the top of my head. I can't believe I remember that Rody Pinto Love. So he's gonna be on the show, and we got some some news that we have a a, a former WWE superstar and a former TNA superstar, which was, was he was with the company for maybe two episodes. Like last month or two months ago, I don't want to give out the name because we're having a couple of back and forth emails. I want to make sure it's one thousand percent. And um, once I get that one hundred percent confirmation, we'll let you know. But this guy's a big name. Uh, we're looking be very having him on the show. So should be a very dominating I, interview. That's my hint. Dominating. That sounds kind of scary. Uh, just to, just because I know who he is and I don't want it. Think about the domination there. So yeah, th- that's kind of uh, not 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 nice. Uh, all right, so <laughs> you threw me off with that hint, man. That, I don't like it. <laughs> well, I was playing off of one of his theme songs. I'm trying not to give too much away, but all right, guys. So yeah, we're gonna have some more information, and um, with that, it, it's that that interview will probably happen within the next seven days here. But all right, guys, we're gonna continue on. We have. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And um, just like you let me take the forefront on the baseball thing, Al. Yeah, this is all yours, buddy. I uh, so this is a difficult, you know, conversation I'm about to have here, and, and I don't even know if it should be had, but it's going to be had. It probably shouldn't. Let's be honest. But you know what? I I feel like awareness has to be brought up. And, but, uh, and I got frustrated when I saw this, just like when I got frustrated with the ALS. But just because um, it shouldn't be mentioned doesn't mean it can't be mentioned. Exactly. So the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, man, you know, it's an awesome segue to this because uh, it literally is the good, the bad, and the ugly. So we're talking, again, it's October 1st. This is uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And we want all you women to go get checked out and you know, get – Test it, make sure everything's great up there. Absolutely. It's a very uncomfortable topic for me, by the way. Uh, but I, I feel like, you know, it's, it's important. I love the awareness that's brought upon. I mean, 
uh, the MB, uh, um, NBA is involved with it. Um, just down here with, and I'm going to mention them again, my Miami Heat um, are having a special scrimmage today, and it's all going to be pinked out. Um, yeah, you know. It's only that, because that, you mentioned the Miami Heat. We couldn't even go an hour. We couldn't we even go an hour. We didn't we even didn't go, go 50 hour. minutes. <laughs> we didn't even go 50 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> all right, so yes, um, the NFL does it. We've done it on our website and, and social media accounts. Um, and the WWE has a close relationship with Susan G. Coleman. And, and you know, the good about this is that it's bringing awareness. And and if anything, just us going pink is my part in doing something. And that's bringing awareness to the cause and, and reminding women to do this test because it's very important. They can prevent it or catch it early um, and not have the cancer, which, which is great. And I love that about this, um, going pink and all that. The bad, you know, and the ugly. This is where it gets a little tricky here. And this is what, this is a topic that maybe shouldn't be be brought up, but with charities in the United States, it frustrates me when I see an annual report on this website. And um, we're going to just go with this one here. This is the executive compensation information for 2013. Back in 2012, it came out with some really bad publicity about where the money was going to and how it was being spent. And um, at the time, Nancy Brinker was the CEO of uh, Susan G. Coleman. At the time, she was making $548,000 annual salary. In 2012, she quote-unquote stepped down, which I'm going to tell you what really happened was she demoted herself created a new um, a new position for herself, and now she's earning $390,000 a year. Um, fine and dandy. They're, they're, they're trying to correct their public image of all the bad charity, because at one point it was 3% only going to research. Now it's up uh, a little bit. At that time in 2012, they brought in Dr. Sal Sal Salerno. So S-A-L-E-R-N-O. Salerno, whatever the case is. Again, keyword there is a doctor. Now, this doctor is making $475,000 a year, roughly about $90,000 less as the CEO and president of the company. This quote, you know, this doctor also oversaw the National Cancer Policy Forum, which is a, a government industry, academic, consumer, and other representatives that, that identifies and examines uh, high priority policies, issues, and cancer. So this is done cleaning up the image. They brought in a doctor because it's better to sell your your company with a doctor there. And I'm telling you, sell your company because only 13% of the money that is being raised is going to actual research. And and and, and um and I just thought it was wrong that that you know you're putting in all this money and only 13% is going to research. And these people are getting paid. Five hundred thousand dollars to be a CEO of a nonprofit organization. So you're selling me on this chair, and it's the same thing with ALS. ALS was at seven percent. That's going to research. Now I would prefer to put my website pink than donate money, and I prefer to show support and the cost for women to go get their, you know, their their stuff checked out than donate money to this. You know, it just doesn't make sense to me, I, and. And that's the ugly part about it. All these charities in the United States keep on saying that they're nonprofit. Yeah, you get and the, and you know what? I'm gonna give it to Susan G. Coleman. I was looking at at um several different websites and I did a couple of, you know research. There's charities out there that the CEOs and board of directors are making millions of dollars each. So. Before you donate, just look at where your money's going. If you don't think the money is the way that you should give, because money is easy. John, you could go and grab $5 and donate. I could go and grab $5 and donate. But what does that do for me? What does that do for somebody that might have breast cancer as not being checked out? My, my way of, of giving back is on this radio show. My way of giving back is on my Twitter handle with my about 5,000 followers on there. That, that's my way of giving back. You know, uh, letting, bringing awareness to the cause. 
my personal opinion, I'm not going to donate to a charity that that's only giving 13% of my money when these people are making 548000 a year annual base salary on a nonprofit charity. So it's good in a sense that, yeah, Susan G. Coleman is a big name. And just to give it to you more perspective, if you want me to break it down and, and why it's frustrating to see this, their March 2013 annual report, they received, you can bear with me, guys, $366 million. Oof. $49 million of that went to research. Doesn't add up to me. It just does not add up to me. Well, they had, they had a good Christmas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and what's funny is that $49 million went to research, but of that $49 million, Six million went to salaries and benefits. Seventeen thousand went to supplies, postage and shipping. Twenty six thousand. Well, that's I mean, understandable. Uh, the way uh, that, absolutely insane. The way that shipping costs are going up, and the way that uh, even stamp costs are going up. I mean, they've gone up. What are they like fifty cents a stamp now? Yeah, I mean it's crazy. That that part I understand, but I mean. The so so of the three hundred sixty-six million, forty-nine million is going to research, forty and six million of that forty-nine million is going to salaries. It doesn't add up, folks. It just doesn't add up. Again, the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is is bringing awareness. The bad and the ugly is I don't know if donating money is the best thing to do in our United States of America. ALS is only at seven percent. Due to my horrible math calculations, uh, <laughs> Susan G. Coleman looks about 13%. Um, there's a lot of charts here, and, and these numbers, with my eye, it's not going to happen right now. But um, So that's me bringing, bringing some light on a matter that people may not know too much of, because it's very easy. Our society has been, I, I don't know, I, I could go on and on with this. Just guys, be aware. He's Wake not up. joking either, guys. He, he, he could really go on and on about this. Yeah, I mean, and if you need more information, you don't believe me, go to SusanGColeman.com. Look in the website. I found it. It took me about 10 minutes. I can even post a link later. Just look at what you're donating. Do some research. Google is a powerful tool. And if you don't believe the first article, go to the second, third, and fourth, and, and look at your sources and, um, and verify them and see what is real and what is not. Um, just cause you know, yesterday I was on Facebook and there was a, a thing that came out where Facebook was going to start charging two ninety nine a month for its users to use Facebook. I got trolled. I thought it was real, but I was like, you know what? This doesn't make sense to me. So I started going on Google it was a huge hoax, but I, at one moment I believed it. So it's good to verify your sources uh, before, you know, you make a decision on so what you, you want to do with your money. from EmpireNews.net. I'm sorry. I said so. You didn't get this news from EmpireNews.net. No, this, this is the this information that S has read off is from Susan or Coleman.org, which is Susan G. Coleman's official website. Okay. I mean, I have all the I have it all here. All the PDF files. It's on their website. They need to put it on there by law uh, where that money is going. So it's like they're asking you for money and they're telling you where it's going and you're still giving and it's not. It's not great, but you know if you that, want to talk about, that, oh, go ahead. No, I, I was gonna say I'm I'm done talking with, about this, but still, it is an awesome cause, and, and we've gone pink for it, and I think we got to get back to what we are about, and it's um main event madness, and we're here to talk about Randy Orange wrestling future. On a lighter and note, want, if if anybody really wants to donate to a cause. You can donate to the John Needs to Get the Hell Out of New York and Move to Florida campaign. Cash donations are welcome. There you go, folks. And it's, it's going hey, to be I, a very I, worthy I'm sure he's going to have a PayPal link up in a couple minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's going to a very worthy cause and that I don't have to deal with another winter. So, there you go. Then Al and I can go on our way to eventually doing bigger, better things. It's inevitable that we'll be bigger and better. <laughs> I had a try. All right, guys, on the lighter note, let's talk about this man that a lot of us love, a lot of us hate, the Viper, Randy Orton. Boo! 
Is that boo because of the news or boo to the Viper? <laughs> boo. All right, guys. So here's the news. Um, Randy Orton looks to be turning on us. That 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 snake. I tell you, he's a snake. I can't believe it. But he, all right, according to the report, WWE is reporting on planning on turning Randy Orton face. Um, very soon. That's why you're starting to see this tension built between Kane and Seth Rollins. Is why is Randy Orton fighting all these matches uh, for Seth Rollins, and uh, he just doesn't. He's getting frustrated, and you're going to continue to see that build and so forth. The belief that the, the <coughs> whoa, whoa, my my voice is with caterpillar out there. Pull it out. All right, the belief is <laughs> that the Green Lantern <laughs> face turn um, wouldn't happen until about the Royal Rumble. Which means now they're talking about a possible match, consideration for possibly WrestleMania of Randy Orton versus Seth Rollins, but it's more likely going to be Randy Orton versus Triple H. I wish I had Ah. a a clip for it. No. Go ahead. No. (laughs) No. 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 (laughs) The last thing we want to see. Is Randy Orton and Triple H again? I mean, the only thing that's fresh about that is the fact that the roles are reversed and Orton's the face and Triple H is the heel. That hasn't been done in it'll be almost eleven years by the time that happens. Can't they go with the original plan and that Batista's gonna leave after WrestleMania next year and they can do Triple H versus Batista? Can't they just do that one? Well so why do you hate it so much that they might be wrestling each other? They've done it so many times so many different variations because of evolution because of dx because of the mcmahon's because of evolution again <laughs> i mean they've done this feud like eight times like every year for at least like two three months was triple h versus randy orton you know what we can even take a look at this 2004 randy orton split off won the world heavyweight championship from stevie rich i mean uh, chris benoit and Who's his first opponent? Triple H. Beat him. Who did Randy Orton spend the next six months feuding with? Triple H. And then, in 2006, Triple H, Shawn Michaels feuded with Rated RKO. Randy Orton. Again, with Triple H. For about... Four months. Triple H comes back in 2007. Who is he feuding with? Randy Orton. Who does Triple H win his world championship from in 2008? Randy Orton. Who does he feud with at WrestleMania 25? Randy Orton. Who does he feud with for like <laughs> most of 2009? Randy Orton. <laughs> oh my god, no. I, if me going off on a tangent about this is any indication, no, I don't want to see this again. No, it's the same thing. And then they're not facing Randy each Orton. other; they're on the same damn team. Huh? <laughs> you heard what? If they're not facing each other, they're on the same team. So you're still exactly. getting variation of Randy Orton or Triple H somehow. Which the fact that after all of these feuds, the fact that everything they did to each other, the fact that you know, would I if I was Triple H? And a man went after and punted my father-in-law in the head, punted and basically damn near murdered my brother-in-law, RKO, DDT'd, and kissed my wife while I was handcuffed to a rope, and I mean, and then hit me with a sledgehammer, knocked me out cold for a month, cost me my final championship that I ever won in the company, Would I, I'd still hold a grudge against him. The fact that he's even been aligned with Triple H for the last year plus makes absolutely no sense. Ah, I don't. Uh, uh, like I said, they like to book stuff and make us think that we're dumb and forgot uh, what happened just six months ago, <laughs> apparently. Not even six months. Like, I remember, was it CM Punk or somebody was talking about it? And they do a storyline. It was the stuff with Big Show last year. And they're like, well, they won't remember six weeks from now. Yes, we will. Like, they completely dropped the ball on Big Show's probably... I mean, I I speak for a few people. I, I know that actually wanted to see Big Show 
beat Triple H's ass or since at that pay per view. So I mean, and then poof, they dropped it, <laughs> and they went back with Triple H, Randy Orton. Holding hand in hand, skipping along the way, down the path of making no GD sense. <sighs> on the latter note, listen, you have rants like every look, week. It was a, I was long overdue for one. I, I don't remember the last time we got a rant for you, so I'm very happy about it. <laughs> but on the latter note, what if we see Triple uh, Randy Orton versus Seth Rollins at Mania? Is that something you would want to see? I'm okay with that. Me too. I think that... that, that as, as long, long as, as I, I don't, don't see the names, Randy Orton versus John Cena, Randy Orton versus Triple H, or, or any... I don't want to see Randy Orton ring face... Ever again, I'll be a happy man. I don't want to see Randy Orton face Kane. I don't want to see Randy Orton face John Cena, Triple H, Batista, or Daniel Bryan. Let's put it this way. If I don't want to see Kane wrestle anybody ever again. So I am done with Kane. I'm done with this mask on, right, mask right. off again. We I'm gotta, done with the corporate. I'm just sick. Hold on. Of, I'm done. Wayne, we gotta we gotta make a. <laughs> Sorry, I don't. If you if you only knew Wayne or Al, apparently your name is Tony Montana, and the police are slowly but surely finding your location. Um, Al or Wayne, we gotta clear something up here. You oh, hear these gosh. police sirens? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just realized we have a chat room going on with the producers back here, and um, my Wayne, apartment, guys. What do you want me to do? <laughs> all right, so Wayne, when Al says his apartment is near the highway, he literally means his apartment is near the highway. You spit a loogie out from his front porch, and you're hitting a car on the opposite side of the road. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I get scared that one day there's going to be a car accident, and I'm going to have a piece of a tire fly through my balcony window. I mean, haven't you almost hit a car that's going by on uh, buying that uh, overpass when you've been stretching in the morning? <laughs> yeah, with my long, elongated arms here. Yeah, it's gets it's it's crazy. I mean, wait, I mean, wait, he barely I has cause an accident out there. <laughs> I mean, he barely has a room for his yoga mat for DDP yoga without it going in the middle of the road and causing an accident. Yeah, it is. They have yeah, done that. It, Didn't you hear about the pileup that they had on that highway? <laughs> it was when I was doing my DDP yoga. It's just no, if you read what he just out. said. <laughs> I'm not going to acknowledge what Wayne just said, but just read the chat and you'll see what he's talking about. Oh, God. We can't even mention this. This is a PG show, <laughs> man. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, it's pretty bad. We'll put it this way. There's times that my family members call me so I could run to my balcony window so I could wave at them while they're driving on the highway to work or from home, or from work to home. Now, now, is it looking straight down or is it looking a little bit over? No, I mean, no, no. You I am literally, I'm clothes. looking outside right now and I eye level, right? Perfect eye level. Pretty much if, if I had a catwalk, I could walk onto the right. highway because it's at the same right. level pretty much. So... If I had a, a, a two by four, I could probably <laughs> lay it out there. <laughs> if there's ever a, an emergency, I could probably save some lives. Put it that way. <laughs> oh, two by four. All right. <laughs> Jim dug in a way shout out topic there. here. But yes, <laughs> Wayne, to settle that once and for all, if Al stretches in the morning, I'm pretty sure he punches out somebody's windshield on the highway. So. Yeah, so every once in a while we're doing the show and you might hear some cops out of the you guys. So in reality, just, they're trying to find Al's location, but for some reason he they they can never find him. And I'm in plain view. It, it, I, it, it, it might be your work looking for you, Al. I don't know. All right, guys, let's get back on track. Here. We're getting a little bit nuts here on Main Event Madness. This is simply madness, my friend. Madness. All right, so let's continue on. We got this show. It's with myself, Alfonso Maramon, and my host, John Curry. Co we used to be known as Wrestling 365. Now we're rolling with Main Event Madness. And um, what's our tagline? It's your our wrestling, it's your sports, simply madness. Look at that. I just did like an impromptu commercial. There you go. That's how we roll. 
It's a beautiful hump day here. We got Bill Bates from SBIBookings.com. He'll be on here shortly within the next 20 minutes or so. We have uh, had several discussions on um, Major League Baseball. We attributed it to Derek Jeter. So once this show is over, we wish you would play it back, listen to us again. You can fast forward um, while John is speaking. I know you guys would rather hear my voice. No, I'm, uh, I'm not going to turn well, TV on. My voice show. is annoying. I wouldn't <laughs> want to hear my voice. But yes, all of our shows are on demand, and um, we just spoke a little bit about Randy Orton, his future, and his baby face turn, potentially. And here's the future of a group that I didn't want to talk about. It's future. Um, a group that I thought would exceed expectations, and uh, cali- uh, I don't know if it's Calypse, is the word I'm looking for? Eclipse. Um, Eclipse, that- Eclipse. Yeah, it's go. like this glass. Oh, eclipse. Like eclipse. I can't believe I say Eclipse. Eclipse the shield. I thought they were. Uh, I thought this run was going to be impeccable. I thought we were going to have the Wyatt family uh, with a string impeccable. of gold, and we were going to have the Wyatt family looking like a gold rush. And uh, <clears throat> I was wrong. We got to get that buzzer noise, by the way. Uh, the Wyatt family had a, an awesome vignette. I'll tell you that. Monday Night Raw, that vignette, we got the video up on the websites. Very cool vignette how they're doing it. Very sad that it's going to happen. And it looks like they're breaking up. I, I, I can't even fathom the thought of them not being together anymore. It, it is frustrating to me. And, and the indication is, is that Luke Harper is going to go on a solo run. It doesn't mean 100,000% that they're breaking up, guys, but it doesn't look good it's going into the future. Would you say that, John? Is that your favorite percentage, 100,000%? 100, 100, did, uh, did I say 100,000% again? Uh-huh. Well, it's a good percentage. <laughs> Luke Harper, and I've said it for a while now. I, I know I don't think I've mentioned it on, show, on the show too much. Luke Harper reminds me a lot of Bradshaw about 12, 13, 14 years ago. He's got the build. He's got. He, he, it kind of resembles him. He shaves the beard a little bit. He would. Re, he would really have that Bradshaw look to him, and I think that it'll help him because they don't have a lot of really. WWE needs some newer big guys. Kane, and you know we talked about this last week. Kane, Big Show, Mark Henry. These guys really, really need to stop. Uh, or WWE rather needs to stop and let these guys kind of move off to the side a little bit and let the newer, bigger guys come in. You know, maybe let Rowan go off on his own. Maybe they're maybe they'll let, uh, they're gonna repackage Eric Rowan with something. Maybe they're gonna, I don't know. Maybe they'll keep him as Bray Wyatt's bodyguard or something. You know what would be actually Eric- interesting is whether or not they have a casket or an a- or some kind of tribute to some or to Sister Abigail and that and he's guarding it. You know, whether they bring it with them, kind of like Undertaker had the urn. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just distraught about the situation, guys. Well, did you see the update about the situation today? I know that Wayne Daly did provide us an impeccable update. If you want to. That is word of the there. day, ladies and gentlemen. Impeccable. Impeccable. Um, so, apparently. Plans are right now for Bray Wyatt to bring the Ascension up to the main roster as his new crew, and, but there's no word whether or not Eric Rowan will continue with uh, Bray Wyatt and his family or go on his own, similar to what Harper's doing. But why? Why would they do that? Fresh. What would be the purpose? Fresh. Keep it fresh. They don't need to keep it fresh. It's already fresh. Listen. The Wyatt family hasn't done nothing in months. Listen. They can put the titles on the Wyatt family. Have hey. Bray Wyatt go on a run. Give Blue Carpenter and Eric Rowan the damn tag team titles. It's br- they haven't giving them done an nothing ex- with these guys. It's giving them an excuse to bring the Ascension up. I'll give them an excuse. Get into the tag team division to go against Stardust and Goldust. They don't need the Wyatt family. What excuse do they need? They're coming up from NXT. That's an excuse enough. No reason for Bray Wyatt to, to replace Eric and Luke. They work well together. They're just not booking them right. They, maybe they realize there's no upside to Eric Rowan, and they want they don't want to hinder uh, 
Luke Harper by keeping him with somebody that isn't that's going to kind of hold him back. Hold him back. It, it, the thing is, they haven't done nothing with the tag team. I, I don't understand. Because maybe the, they the, realize the there is no upside to You're Eric trying to Rowan. justify something that, that is unjustifiable to me, in my eyes. No because reason maybe why they realize there's no upside there. There's no reason Rowan. to break up the White family. They haven't even hit their pinnacle. They because haven't hit they their haven't, stride yet. They haven't, they're young. They're not... They're, they're, there's so Eric many Rowan. reasons why the White family shouldn't break up. They're not even know why we're having this discussion right now. I, it's I not a discussion. Now, it's you you're not letting them be. To, together and break up the tag team and have Harper go in singles competition and Eric Rowan for whatever reason. That's fine because he can't I go. Think it's incorrect. At least he's at least maybe in their eyes he can't go in the ring, and they don't want to hold back a talent that they feel could be bigger than just in a tag team. They have a tag team waiting in the wings that could be what the Wyatt family was for Bray Wyatt for the last year and a half and use them for that purpose. They're younger guys. They could learn from Bray Wyatt. They could learn, you know, and, and adapt to the main roster and let Luke Harper go off on his own and become his own star. I mean, from what it looked like, they're not, like, completely disowning each other. You know, maybe there's going to be some kind of affiliation there. Or something. Maybe there's still going to be some kind of partnership. But, I mean, obviously WWE has very little confidence in Eric Rowan. Because outside of Daniel Bryan, Roman Reigns, and John Cena, he has no single matches. And, I mean, the, what you hit on with Eric Rowan not... Or, the rather, the Wyatt family not wrestling lately. Maybe either he's injured, or maybe they just realize, well, you know what? This guy really has no upside to him. Let's just hit the refresh button and start again. And you know what? Seeing an interesting dynamic like the Ascension with the characters that they are down in NXT with somebody like Bray Wyatt, it's going to be very interesting. I, I totally disagree. I think that... You don't think that Bray Wyatt and the Ascension is going to be an interesting tandem? I think there's already an interesting tandem and, and they, they, they screwed it up. They've screwed it up, and they don't know what to do to fix it. And, and but how could they me, have screwed it up? If, if, if you're if, telling me Bray Wyatt needs to bring up the Ascension, what does that have to say about the Ascension? What does that have to say about the Wyatt? It says family? good things to for me, the Ascension. It says that booking is crap right now. It says and good you, things for the Ascension. If Bray Wyatt's going out of his way and says, look, I want these guys with me, what does that say for them and their reputation? It says that they're good enough and they want him with what will be a main event act very shortly. So so you you, you simply end the careers of Eric of How Eric is that Rowan? ending the That's career? That's what you're telling me. Like I said, maybe they realize that Rowan doesn't have an upside. Maybe they realize he needs more training or something. He was easily the greenest of the three. And, I mean, you're not ruining the career of Luke Harper. Luke Harper is going to go off on his own and do just fine. Luke Harper can talk. Luke Harper can, can go in the ring. He'll be just fine. If they really want to turn Bray Wyatt babyface, which is what the, these rumors are right now, then you can easily have Luke Harper take that heel spot that Bray Wyatt was in. Maybe not to the point of being a main eventer, but... If they keep him with the creepy gimmick and everything that he had, I think I think it'd be actually pretty good. But I, I you know what would even be even better? He doesn't talk. He just comes in and he just obliterates people and then leaves. He doesn't talk. He doesn't do anything. Ooh, what if you put Luke Harper with Paul Heyman? See, it doesn't make sense to me, though. No, 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 no. Don't talk about the Wyatt family splitting up. Answer that. Luke Harper's on his own. We're, we're say a month, two months from now. Luke Harper's on his own already. Luke Harper and Paul I, I, Heyman. I, I, I'm, to me, there's no discussion because my mind is so set that this shouldn't happen that I don't even want to think about. The Try to distance yourself from that opinion. Happen. Answer. I, I, answer I think that. Correct. Go ahead. Answer that. Distance yourself from that opinion. Answer that. Luke Harper's on his own. He's been obliterating people for a month. Let's say two months from now. All of a sudden, Paul Heyman approaches him on TV and says, I'm looking for a new Paul Heyman guy. Are you interested? In, the, in his, Paul Heyman's way of doing it. All of a sudden, you have a guy who can go in the ring, who can dominate people, and you have somebody who can go on the mic and dominate people in, in promos. 
that's a very good mix. I I would even argue that would be a mix that you could even throw in with money in the bank next year. And Wayne's I, not even jumping know. in on this. I, I want to ask you this: What if the Wyatt family does? Ha- it happens that the inevitable ha- inevitable happens, and they are done as we see them today. It's going to be like. It's, this is how I see it. You want me to bring in a correlation? The the big three are together, and they left before anything happened. It would have been like Carmelo Anthony leaving the Knicks before he got a championship. Like, why Why is this? It would be a failure in my eyes that they are breaking up way, way too early. That they're changing the dynamic of the team before things are even before the potential is even reached. Just like LeBron James leaving the Heat, and I'm sorry, I know you guys hate that I bring this up, but he had the potential to go possibly to another NBA Finals if he stayed with the Heat with this dynamic and do something special. He decided to leave early and risk it. He has a great team now, but he had something that was definite. Well, let's you know, go. I, and he... And they already had success, so that's hard for me to make the correlation. I like the correlation of Carmelo Anthony saying he has unfinished business. I'm sticking with my team and my decision. I feel like it's just too soon to break up the Wyatt family. One of the most dynamic trios we've seen in years, aside from the Shield, which I also think was a premature breakup. I think they could have dominated some more time. They were getting a call like following, and these were going great. Granted, now it's looking like a good thing because, well, not even because everyone's injured or whatever, but uh, I'm just saying, I just think that it's way too soon for this group. What's your thoughts? I already gave my thoughts, but if he's willing, I want some more entertainment on this, and I want to bring in Mr. Wayne Daly of Wrestling-News.net if he's willing and to give us a little bit of his opinion. Ah, oh, come on! You're not going to make him mad. Okay, he doesn't want to come on. Never mind. I wanted to get I wanted to get a, a third take on this situation with the Wyatts. No, All right, guys. No. I, I'm sorry. I was just reading up a, a chat. Yes, I believe the Chill was premature. They're doing great now, I understand that, and it probably timing lined up perfectly, seeing how Punk left. Daniel Bryan is all screwed up. Look at Roman Reigns, he, he's um, down with injury now as well. Dean Ambrose is a beast. Seth Rollins is doing his thing. Okay, they, that's fine. They, it worked out at the end uh, due to all the roster changes. I understand that, and, but the, the league probably got lucky in that aspect. It's it doesn't change the fact that I think that – they were a dominating trio, and they could have been a, a, around a little bit longer um, than they were. Uh, that's all I think with the Shield. The Wyatt family, I really think it's going to be a premature breakup if they do it this soon. I, I think they, they never reached their potential. Um, Bray Wyatt got slaughtered by John Cena in those matches he had against him. I don't understand why he was so buried at Mania. did not make any sense to me. So... I mean, that, that's my take on that. I, I just think that it's not time to do it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think it's a good thing. I think Luke Harper is going to do just fine on his own. Eric Rowan is where it gets touchy. Eric Rowan's going to be interesting whether or not he goes back to NXT or whether or not he... He meant to reinvent Wyatt. himself um, exactly. after they do break up. I think I, I do see I see the upside in Bray Wyatt as a single competitor. I'm not naive to the fact that Luke Harper has a step up on Eric Rowan. Um, he's, he, he, he has a, a great playable character, and he could do fine on his own. Eric Rowan is the one that, that, that is, uh, might have a, a tougher time um, in this whole situation. Mm-hmm. So, But remember, at one point, everyone said that that Dean Ambrose uh, was going to be the one to be, you know, the undercard. And he, he's like in the main event picture now. So you never know what could happen, right? Uh, we don't know 
um, what the future holds. I, I, I do not want to see them split. You, you do. Um, it's not that I do want to see the split. Have different points of view. It's not that I think I, you're 100 percent wrong. I, it's not that I do want to <laughs> see the split, but I mean, you, you got to look at what what the positives are from it. Bray Wyatt's more than likely going to be a bigger bigger act with the Ascension. The Ascension have their own cult esque following, so it, it'll be interesting. Yeah, and you got to remember what happens at. At NXT and the full sale university tapings, um, it's very different. We, we've come to find out when a when they had the backing of the NXT cult like following. Remember that they they, they have a, an amazing crowd that goes to the to those those events and those tapings, as we see with Adam Rose and and and, and we've seen with Bo Dallas. The, it doesn't always happen the same way when it comes to the main roster. So we don't know how the main WWE Monday Night Raw crowd is going to react to the Ascension on a long-term basis. You know, it's one of those things that they're going to have to test them out and see how they grow. So I'm just saying that it's different. It's different when they bring up a talent because they think they're going to be able and that same Colock following, but NXT is already watched by a certain number of people. And it's now watched by the entire WWE universe. So when someone, someone like Adam Rose is, in, is introduced to Monday Night Raw, he's being introduced to millions of viewers and compared millions. to just a couple, a couple thousand or a few thousand, hundred thousand people that are watching on NXT on the WWE network. So that's meant. To, I know we're gonna have a uh, Bill Barons here up in a, in a second, and that's right. WWE Network is just. Four nine ninety nine. I don't know if you you don't have that queued up yet. I don't know what's going on with you, John. You're slacking. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. We got we got a lot a lot of things going on in the background. We got Bill Burns about to come on. We're gonna hit some commercial commercials here in a second. Um, on the other end of the interview, we'll talk a little bit about the NBA. Nine ninety nine. That's right, folks. Nine ninety nine. All right, guys. So, uh, John, are we ready to move on here? Yep, I believe we got some com uh, commercial break coming up here, and then when we get back, we're going to have Mr. Bill Barons joining us. So stick around, guys. We'll be back in a little bit. Looking for more than your average wrestling website? Looking for the fastest-growing wrestling news site on the Internet today? With quality news, results, and more. Wrestling News Report has everything you'd want in a wrestling website. Al Merriman has you covered with the latest and biggest stories of the day from all around the world of pro wrestling. Check them out today, WrestlingNewsReport.com. Hey you, yeah, you, looking for quality wrestling news with an international flair? Looking for results and news from around the world? Look no further than Wrestling-News.net. Wayne Daly and his crew have you covered from top to bottom, from WWE to TNA to the top independent companies from around the world. Check them out, wrestling-news.net. So you're cruising around the internet looking for some entertainment. What if I told you there's a hard-hitting, fresh, and opinionated podcast out there covering everything from WWE and TNA to the NFL, the NBA, and MLB? Well, that's reality. Main Event Madness is here. Don't miss us every week on MainEventMadness.com as well as on TuneIn Radio and Stitcher.com. Main Event Madness, our wrestling, your sports, simply madness. Hear that? That music used to instill fear in women around the world, and now it instills excitement as former WWE diva and TNA knockout Amazing Khan is coming to Main Event Madness. Join us October 6th for a special Monday edition of Main Event Madness live from 12.30 to 2 p.m. Eastern on Spreaker.com slash Wrestling365.
All right, guys, we're back here on Main Event Madness, our first show. We're live on MainEventMadness.com, Wrestling-News.net, and WrestlingNewsReport.com. At this time, we're going to bring in wrestling booker, Mr. Bill Behrens. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yep, and I believe Al, or Al Merriman, and you guys actually, I believe, spoke before back in uh, when he used to do uh, Force of Wrestling Radio, I believe. Probably so. I've, so. I've done a few of these things. <laughs> All right, Bill, how's it going? Yeah, it was about, I don't even know how long ago, uh, years ago, it's Alfonso Marmont here. I wanted to thank you uh, for taking time with us today and uh, talk a little bit of wrestling with us and uh, your experiences, and I really appreciate it. I know we've been kind of back and forth here for about a month now, so it means a lot that you were able to get some time off and uh, sit with us uh, for the next uh, few minutes here. Look forward to it. And uh, whatever, whatever you guys want to bring up, I'll do my best to try to sound semi-intelligent. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sounds great, Bill. I appreciate it. All right. So I, I wanted to get kind of uh, right into, you know, we mentioned uh, what you do and who you are, but I wanted to kind of uh, get it from you and uh, uh, talk about, you know, you've been helping wrestling stars for what now nearly a decade or so, right? Uh, with live events well, and I, bookings. Or... Depending on how you look at it, it's uh, my glorious career uh, more or less started in USWA and the early 90s, but by the end of the 90s, when USWO was out of business and I started promoting with Burt Prentiss, I learned pretty quickly that uh, what I was good at was uh, recognizing and developing talent, and what I was bad at was promoting. Uh, and even though I was persistent in being stupid and promoted <laughs> for a number of years, I finally uh, uh, got involved with something we called NWA Wildside in Georgia and had a, a nice six-year six run there, and we developed a lot of stars that have proven to be stars in the business today. And now I'm doing the same thing in the same little building. It's the only way. I don't pay the bills anymore, thank God. But um, it, running in one building was what I learned was the only way I was ever going to survive as a promoter was the only way I could control expenses. Otherwise, I was going to go, go crazy and have much more gray hair than I do now. But uh, that's basically what I do, and the, the concept of developing talent leads naturally into representing that talent. And then when I became associated, as I have been over the years with WWE a number of times, WCW when it was in business, TNA off and on, um, and various other companies, uh, you end up meeting other folk, and then they uh, end up back on the indies and need representation, so that expanded my business. But I guess the core of my business is representing talent careers, uh, which starts with AJ Styles, continues with uh, Matt Seidel, the former Evan Bourne, Chris Daniels, and uh, and folk like that. And then there's the diversity of other people that I represent on a booking by booking basis. So it's uh, it's actually a full time job. I, I get to be in the glorious wrestling business all the time. And do you, do you travel to a lot of these events that you book the talents for, or this is mainly you're at your your home office or your office, and and you're getting uh, these connections uh, uh, for your talents and booking them um, uh, throughout the United States? Is that how that that works normally? Well, I'm I'm more of a real agent. Real agents don't go to shows with the talent. The guys that that go to shows with the talent and want to ride, have them ride in their cars, are are something else. And and and. and Fortunately, I guess for me, mo many of the other people that like to call themselves agents are much more interested in interacting up to up close and personal with the wrestlers and sort of being star by association. Uh, and I, I couldn't give a damn about that. Um, <laughs> and, and, and if I never go to another wrestling show again that I'm not involved in creatively or, or working with talent, it, it'll be too soon. Um, I can't stand. In fact, when I go visit WWE shows, I tell them going in, I'm, I'm probably going to leave after a couple of hours after I say hi to everybody and steal food, and then, <laughs> then I'm, I'm going to go home. I, you know, I really don't need to to stay here and make sure you guys can still do RAW. So uh, you know, that uh, I take this very seriously. It's it's not a hobby. And that makes me a little bit unique. I don't know that there are really any other full-time wrestling agents. There are people that try to purport to be that, but they all come home from a nine-to-five job, and then they play wrestler uh, wrestling agent at night. Much like there are more weekend warrior wrestlers than there are actual wrestlers making a living in the wrestling business. Definitely. And, and um, you know, you, you've been doing this for, for years. And, and before I get to that question, 
uh, when you have your talent, and this is just me out of curiosity, you have obviously a um, a real Dex of talent. You have a, a lot of major talent you represent. Does are they able to go book with somebody else, or or does everything kind of go through you, and you just help manage that? Depends. Um, mm-hmm. Everything's a little bit different. The one thing I do tell uh, most talent. Uh, that those that I, I that come to me and I don't I wear I don't go to talent I don't solicit business either which is mm-hmm. weird but I just wait for people to come to me by recommendation uh, as happened just recently with Ezekiel Jackson or their or big uh, big whatever he is now Rex um, you know he I guess was being helped by other folk who really weren't helping him so he's hopeful I can help him who knows I, I have no idea I just mm-hmm. put out a press release yesterday and we'll see what happens. Um, guys like AJ, I'm the only person that books anything for them. Uh, no other agent could do it. Uh, same for Chris Daniels. Uh, Kaz will do a few things on his own. Matt Seidel, I do everything for him. Um, and then there's people who will take bookings themselves, but like me to do as much as I possibly can because they prefer the way I organize things. That'd be somebody like Sean Waltman or, or even, you know, Scott Hall to an extent. Um, but it all, it varies. Uh, and then there's guys that take bookings to a number of people and that occasionally can be problematic because not everybody does this the same way. I, I, I won't be specific on the wrestler or the other agent, but I had a fairly well-known wrestler who, um, I was quoting a thousand dollars plus air and hotel as that person's asking fee at their request. Cause I don't come up with these fees off the top of my head and I don't, I don't pull them out of any other orifice. Um, it, it's, it's worked out by the talent. And then I quote those fees, and then, good news, promoters always have much more power than me because they have the ability to say no. You know, I, don't, I can't force anybody to say yes. Mm. So, you know, nothing can ever be forced on a promoter, and any promoter that doesn't like working with a real agent is, is simply somebody suggesting to the world that they want to try to rip somebody off. Um, but anyway, I quoted a thousand to this guy and he said, Oh wait, uh, that's not his rate. Uh, another agent, blah, blah, sent mm-hmm. me his price list for talent. And that guy is actually seven fifty. And I went, really? Okay, good to know. I'll be back in touch. So I c- called up this particular wrestler and I said, I just wanted to let you know your rate is now seven fifty. And he said, no, it isn't. It's a thousand. You know that. And I said, yes, I do. I said, however, mm-hmm. the other guy that's helping you not only has not quoted that correctly, but he's doing one of the cardinal no-nos in the business, which is he's on a piece of paper putting down everybody's name and next to it a number and then distributing that to people, which means, of course, that that document will end up being distributed all over the place, and Mm -hmm. now people are sharing bad information. And so for this particular talent, I had to remind him that he'd better go, you know, ream the other person because that guy now is going to cause me and or him or anyone he may want to represent him to have some people go, oh, no, I saw the price list and and I know that he's taking lower rates. And that's the, the most difficult aspect of the job. Um, my job is to get as much money as I can for the client and then make sure they're as well treated as possible. They have direct flights where possible as opposed to flying through Guam. They're staying at a hotel that does not have condom machines in the hallway. Um, you know, they're being treated more like stars than like baggage. Promoters' priority is to spend as little money as possible and to get as much as they can for that money regardless of how many, how much they're overspending. Um, uh, promoters, historically, in my, in my experience, will spend a, money, a good money on a fee and then try to nickel and dime the things that matter more to the talent the day of the show and when they have that talent there than any other area. So after they've paid the guy, um, and the deposit's always required and stuff like that, You'd think they'd be smart enough to know that the more comfortable and happy somebody is when they're working for you, the more likely you're going to get more from them rather than less. Mm. You know, and and we we hear about guys showing up at shows and instead of doing a 20 minute match, they do a five minute match and storm out of the ring and just say, where's, where's my freaking money? Um, you know, I don't know if, if in every case it's true, but in some of the cases it may well be because, well, they were treated, you know, 
like low rent from the moment they got there because the the promoter was nickel and diming it, and you know that that's a mistake. It'd be smarter for promoters to book one good star, treat that guy or girl well, and trust the rest of that local crew to do the rest of the job. That's a big mistake promoters make. Is and thank God for it, by the way, from my perspective, um, mm-hmm. is they go under the more is better concept of booking. If one star is good, four, four is great. And that isn't true. One well-promoted star will always draw more than four stars, even if they're well-promoted. It, and it'll be more cost-efficient. You don't, you don't need more to draw more because stars don't draw, promoting does. You, you cannot put any name on a marquee and automatically sell tickets. It does not happen. Ask TNA. They put plenty of names on a marquee, including some of the biggest names in the business, and drawn low hundreds. I mean, heck, Ring of Honor outdraws them right now. No, that's, and you know, and now you, you open up my eyes because there used to be a huge uh, wrestling promotion down here in South Florida. And for the life of me, I can't remember the name. I don't know if it was a CCW. But they used to hold these events, and they used to have a plethora of stars. I mean, the whole – it was the Patriot, the, at the time of Badass Billy Gunn. I mean, all these – I mean, 20 different stars. But you would go there, and there was about 20 fans at the event. And, well, needless to say, we're not in business anymore. <laughs> well, well, so, that's, uh, that's because the promoter was more excited about the association with the, the wrestling star – than the business of wrestling. Um, you know, and, and again, I, I start this by saying to any, you know, as I criticize promoters, which I, I do frequently, I am a terrible promoter. That, and, but I know that. Mm-hmm. So I am not, I've never paid, the most I ever had a res, piece of wrestling talent paid at a show I was involved in um, was probably Terry Taylor. Uh, back in the wild side days, and I wasn't paying the bills then. I would, we had the way the deal went. I was involved in the TV and the distribution, and and handled all of that revenue, you know, all that expense and revenue. And then the promoting side of it was done by some other folk until I bought them out. And um, I told them to book Terry Taylor for a match. He was the North NWA North American Champion at the time, and uh, we brought him in. And he worked Mike Rapata, who went on to be North American Champion and then NWA World Champion during that time. And they questioned why, and I said, trust me, it'll be a good idea. And I'd I'd known Terry for a while, because prior to that, he had been in talent relations at WWE, and I'd worked with him off and on there. And uh, so we brought Terry in, paid him well, and he was in our building and saw what we did differently than other people, which is we just didn't put a show on. We educated. You know, when somebody came to the back, it wasn't, hey, good match, kid. You know, slap him on the ass and off he goes. Um, instead, it was, why did you do this? And wouldn't it have better, better to do that? AJ Styles tells stories all the time about hating me. When, um, you know, and, and I'm now, uh, as a, you know, sort of a second dad to him. But mm-hmm. um, he hated me when I came in because he was the fair-haired golden child that could do no wrong. And, you know, by God, he was talented. But he would do stupid stuff. You know, he would do stuff for the spots for the sake of spots rather than storytelling. And he'd come to the back and I'd look at him and go, that was just stupid. Uh, you know, <laughs> when he wanted, you know, why did you do that? Why did you set a, a ladder up to dive on, to have somebody move and to smash your back into it? What did that accomplish other than hurting yourself? You know, and if you do too many of those, you're not going to make it to 37 years old as he is now and the top star in the business. You know, you got to learn to do less, and you got to learn to do less really well. And that's what a lot of guys don't know is uh, more is not ever better. Same thing with, you know, like with promoting. More stars, not better. Just more expense. More moves in a match, not better. Make it more holy shit chance, but you're not going to have anybody remember anything when they go home. It'll be the equivalent of, of a fireworks display. Nobody will remember anything except there were bright lights and pretty colors. And when it gets down to the match that told a story and that suspended your disbelief for a moment, that one you'll remember. You know, people remember uh, Randy Savage and Ricky Steamboat, not because it was a whatever the heck a five-star or four-star match is, because God knows I have no idea what that is. But they don't remember it for that. They remember it for its realism and the fact that it kept them captivated and interested. 
it wasn't the pyrotechnics, it was the technique. That's a big difference. Um, and today, I just, you know, uh, I think part of the problem is the reason WWE starts everybody over when they come down to development is most people have been badly trained. Most people think spots and crowd and Pavlovian and crowd pops before storytelling. And wrestling is willing suspension of disbelief storytelling. If you don't do that, you're screwing up. And that's what we tr- that's what we try to teach, and that was say. So when I brought Terry in, and we paid him more money than we ever paid anybody else in the building, it ended up that a few months later, uh, they hired me uh, to handle the development for WCW out of that very same building, and all the guys that had paid the money to bring him in were getting a piece of that action, and then they understood. Mm. And, and let me ask you this: You have a unique perspective. You've been booking talent for so many years. Uh, have you had, have you witnessed a change in the industry compared? Uh, obviously, there's been a change, but what would you say is the biggest change from when you started uh, to now, if any? Or you think the core of it is all the same? Uh, at the core, it's still very similar. There's there's a lot of very good, there's a lot of very bad, and then everything else is in the middle. Um, and it's always been that way. And, and by the way, it was always that way even back in the day. I used to like, every time I hear a veteran go, you know, back in the day, I remember how real it was. And I go, yeah, back when they wrestled bears. You know. <laughs> yeah, it was much more real then. Okay, you know, it, it, but it was different. We had fewer entertainment choices. We had three TV stations in a city instead of 300 on on. We, it, it was a different marketplace. You know, a, a movie was a big deal. Uh, every movie, you know, going to the movie theaters was a huge deal. There were, you know, when a concert came to town, it was a huge deal. When wrestling came to town, it was a huge deal. Now wrestling is one of many things that we're asking people to potentially leave their home to see. And bad news, we're also giving it away all over the place in one and up to two-hour blocks throughout the week, which means, well, I really don't have to go see it. They're being nice enough to show me all this stuff, and unlike back in the day, they're not showing me squash matches most of the time. They're showing me good stuff. I don't need to go anywhere. So we've, we've challenged ourselves just because the way everything works, the way entertainment works in general, has changed. And in that, wrestling changed. But, and, and the believability changed for the same reason that Technology has changed. Back in the day, you could do the same match with the same people all over the country, and very few people knew. You know, you'd have to find somebody that happened to travel someplace else, and all of a sudden they went, wait a minute. You know, Jack Briscoe's wrestling Dory Funk again, and it's going an hour? How often does that happen? You know, <laughs> and, 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 you know, but most of the time, all you knew was what was going on around you. When you were when you were a big fan, uh, and and that that's changed now because now everyone is a wrestling expert. Just just ask the internet; they all know more than I do. They all know more than everybody that books every single show, and they always know it after the fact much better than they do before the fact. Um, because of course, it's much easier to be a genius when you see what happens and can disagree with it, than trying to figure out what's going to happen. Um, very few people are really good at booking on the front, but everybody is great booking on the back end. Um, it's, it's awfully easy to be critical, um, of everybody, but that, that I think those are the biggest changes that have gone on in the business right now. And, and Jeff Jared and I were having this discussion recently. Um, and, and it, it's the Indies are as viable and as vibrant as they ever have been. And I know that because I work within them and I, and I know how much money is coming in. Jeff doesn't know that because he hasn't been on the indies. He really has done very few indies in his life. Uh, the only indies he did, I booked him on during the TNA time. And prior to that, he was working a circuit with his dad. You know, he went straight to WWE from WWE to WCW. From WCW, he went on the road with WWA and did some international stuff and immediately to TNA. And only when he was in TNA did he go out and occasionally do some indies at the beginning because at the beginning, the money wasn't coming in real good and he had already blown a bunch uh, in, the origi- in the initial effort before Panda came in. So it was good to go out and get some bookings. But So he never really had a reference, but now he's been going around to places and getting paid and seeing that there's guys there that are out there hustling and are drawing five, six, seven, eight hundred over a thousand people and putting on some strong shows. Not all of them are profitable because of the more is better 
you know, problem. Um, because sometimes somebody will draw a thousand people, but spend, you know, the old joke is, how do you make a million dollars in the wrestling business? You spend $2 million. Um, and it's, it's very similar, uh, for a lot of promoters. The uh, wrestlers see a lot of people and assume success. Um, however, the more wrestlers that are seeing a lot of people and the more of them that are highly paid, the more likely the guy's losing his shorts. But, but as Jeff has noticed and I've noticed, there's more people out there spending money promoting wrestling and drawing audiences than there was five, six years ago. Um, so like everything else, wrestling is cyclic. Um, on a national level, it may not be like it was back during the Monday Night Wars, but it, I don't think it, it ever can be that again. I don't think it'll ever get up to that. But but the four million people that WWE draws with a Raw is still a hell of a lot of people. And even the million people that TNA draws is a hell of a lot of people. You know, in today's marketplace. Definitely. Yeah, you, you answered a couple of my questions. I wanted to know, like, the differences um, uh, of how it is right now compared to about five, ten years ago. So you are seeing uh, somewhat of a growth in, in, um, in the independent market right now when it comes to, to wrestling, which is great. So I, I was there's, curious there's to know, like, of guys, there's a handful of guys that are the exception to the rule I've been spouting about one guy is better than five. Mm -hmm. um, I was just on the phone with Mike Lombardi, uh, who promotes Northeast Wrestling. Oh, we, um, we had him on the show a couple of weeks back. Hey, he's an awesome, really, really and, awesome. What he's doing. And yeah. Mike, Mike is one of those rare guys that when I was charging a very, very large fee, very large fee for Kurt Angle, ridiculous fee. Because we basically didn't want to send Kurt out to work unless we were really getting paid, because TNA was keeping the money at the time, based on how mm. Kurt's deal was written. And, um, and Mike paid that money. And made money. Yeah, and, and I don't know that anybody else that booked Kurt did. Much like when Ric Flair was out working for 10000 a shot, most people lost their shorts on that deal. Even if they got to keep the, the gimmick sales. Um, it, it just... It, you have to... You know, bringing Ric Flair in and sitting him down doesn't mean you're going to draw anybody. And I know one guy in Alabama booked him and didn't draw more than four or 500 people. And based on a $10,000 investment where you can, you know, do the math, 10 to $20 ticket, their gate didn't even cover that one guy. Uh, that's absolutely, I mean, it's crazy. Uh, and Mike Lombardi, I mean, he's been doing a lot of great shows out there. Um, you know, so we've been, happy we've been to talking because I'm coming up. I got AJ. We I just uh, confirmed Matt Seidel with him for the show with AJ. Awesome. Um, and and you know he, he had Matt in for a previous show. Uh, it, he's he's the guy. He, you know anybody. I I never feel badly when I book somebody for him. There are times with some guys where I'm hopeful <laughs> when the the whole thing's over that they're happy with what they did and not trying to blame me for their failure. Um, but in general, I'm getting more positive feedback from promoters than negative now in terms of their success level. Um, oh, that's, few, that's awesome. fewer that I'm booking guys for large fees and many of my, you know, my, I, I'd like to say most of my most successful guys are making somewhere between a thousand and three thousand dollars a booking. Um, so, you know, in promoter brain, if you're selling a ten dollar seat that and you book a thousand dollar guy, a hundred people have to come based on that one guy alone, and that doesn't count the flight and hotel. So, you know, that that's how you you're supposed to do your math. But more people are coming out of that kind of financial reality successful than were a few years back. So that's encouraging. That's one of the reasons Jeff can go around and embrace indies and call what he's doing global force wrestling. Right now, Global Force Wrestling doesn't exist, except in a name. But the more people who are interested in it, and the more places Jeff sees that are viable, the more likely he can use other people's success to potentially create something. And, and let me ask you, Bill, um, looking back on it now, are you satisfied with your business, and is there anything you would have changed uh, from what you've learned over all these years at this point? Or are you, are, are, at this point, are you a well-oiled machine, and <laughs> Everything's moving on full throttle for you. The only thing I've learned in wrestling is that every time I think I understand how the system works, it changes and sc and screws me up. Um, there's a lot of little things that I can look back and say, "Golly, could I have done that differently?" And would you know, I, I last time I was with WWE, I was uh, in charge of helping develop the talent and doing the television for Deep South, and 
without great description, uh, the uh, the other nice folks that were working with me there that WWE had decided to hire without any of us coming in together was like, like, we'll take this guy, we'll take this guy, we'll take this guy, and we'll put them together and we'll make them work well together, even though we have no idea if they're going to be able to do that. Um, when the end, the end game was I wasn't allowed to do the job I was hired for, and I was being paid a pretty good amount of money. And I could have done one of two things. One would have been swallow my pride and do what everybody else wanted me to do and be miserable, but make good money. You know, and, and for at least the two and a half years that company existed, I would have made that money. And it might have been more than I ended up making at TNA. It, it was, you know, it's a coin tosser because I had no idea what was going to happen. But after three months and I couldn't do the job that I was hired for, I wasn't going to have whatever limited reputation I have you know, destroyed by me creating a television product that they, WWE, wouldn't like, and it would have been Stephanie it went to, and and then have to whine and pout, well, I'm not being allowed to do my job, and then, you know, and then the other guys saying, oh, no, it's his fault, and then, you know, I'm miserable again. So when we realized we couldn't fix it, I was allowed to resign by John Laurinaitis. I, fortunately... Jeff Jarrett had an idea at TNA that involved booking their talent out because we needed to, they needed to get people under guaranteed contracts. So we ended up sending our talent to third-party promoters as a way to raise money to then guarantee people talent. We filtered indie money through TNA and back as weekly guarantees to the talent in a formula we created that worked really, really well for two or three years. And, and then it didn't. So, you know, there's a lot of little regrets, but in general, uh, it's worked out okay. I, you know, it's, I, could have made my, I could have made more money at, t- at times than I did, but I, I always have made my decisions the same way, which is, you know, what, am I happy? And if I'm not, then usually I'm going to get out of it. I'd rather be happy than just make money, dumb as that may sound. And, and, and let me ask you, your, your plans for SBI bookings, um, what, what, what are your future plans five, ten years from now? Do you see yourself still doing this? Uh, let's see. I'm uh, coming up on 58, so I need, if I, uh, I, if you're going, you know, five years, uh, by then I'll be collecting government money. Because, by <laughs> golly, I'll, I'll cash in at 62. I ain't going to wait till 65. <laughs> and, um, and at that point I'll be able to subsidize my, my being on the phone and being on the internet and booking talent out. Uh, who, who knows by then? Uh, AJ Styles may be um, uh, overweight and coaching his son's football <laughs> game, and there'll be a new crop of talent, and who knows how successfully he'll be booking, and who knows where the business will be at that point. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it'll be around. I think it'll still be a very viable business because uh, there's really nothing that can ever replace what wrestling is and uh, and be what wrestling is. Wrestling is a a truly unique art form, and I do believe it to be an art form. Um, uh, the best of wrestling is comparable to the best of theater, to the best of any other form of, of entertainment art. Uh, the closest comparison to what a wrestler does is improv comedy. Uh, and and it's, when it's done well, and people are allowed to know it's fake and believe it anyway, then you know you've accomplished something. It's like a good movie. You know, at the end of Brian's song, Every Guy Cries. And that, that, that kind of ability, the ability of, of, of a movie to take you beyond the, you know, these are actors performing roles, but all of a sudden you buy the actor and you believe in that and you're able to believe in the reality of the film and feel it emotionally. Wrestling has that unique ability to tap into emotion um, and, all, and, the, and the gambit of emotions. And all many times within a single match, you can have humor, you can have, you can have anger, you can have happiness, you can have all that range of emotion, and it can all happen in, in one match between two people, or if you look at a show as the three-ring circus, you can provide the most diversified form of, of improvised entertainment that's possible. So I think that uniqueness will always keep wrestling viable, and as long as the creative aspect of it doesn't try to over- script, the improvisation that's necessary to make it work, uh, wrestling will continue to be very vibrant. The more scripted it is, the more rehearsed it may or may, may become because of being overly scripted, the less it's going to grow as an art form. Mm-hmm. 
it's going to become something else. It'll be more of like a stage play. And a lot of stuff opens and closes on Broadway very quickly if it's not written well. And on that note, you know, on our, on our website or one of our websites, WrestlingNewsReport.com, we put up a poll and we asked everybody if they were scared about the future of professional wrestling. 59% said they were. Uh, what do you have to say to those folks? Uh, I, I think that pessimism in professional wrestling, like in anything, is, is, that it is very high. We, we have a, uh, we're very good as, as, as a race. Uh, of you know human beings, you know uh, the human people, we're we are almost uh, universally um, negative in terms of how we interpret things, uh, and we also if if facts don't back that up, well we'll just make it up. You know that that's sort of how we do things. You know if and you know you don't. You know I'll give you an example, and it's a minor one. It has to come from it comes from the real world. Like I I, I love on on the Facebook, and this is not pro our president, negative our president, but it just happens to do with our president. There's been a lot of recent reports on news services that, you know, this Obama guy, he's going freaking crazy. He's, he's doing all these executive orders. He's going wild here. The executive orders, I mean, the man is just, he's a, he's a whack case. He's doing all these executive orders, and no one's ever done that before. Well, you know, in, until you actually go look at what all the other guys did, and you find out that within the last six presidents, he's, he's not even in the top four, you know, it's, so it, yeah, you know, it's, we, if, if, if we're not, if we can't figure out a way to, to be negative on something, there's always a way that some of us will find it. Um, we're more likely to criticize what we see than to praise it. And as a result, that leads to a negative perception because it's, you know, it's, it perpetuates. If, you know, people, I can't believe that they did, did that, you know, well, for example, I mean, just today, what poor WWE is, is apologizing for, uh, uh, you know, a Russian flag being torn down um, because somehow that, I guess, is going to offend, you know, Russians within the fantasy that is professional wrestling. Um, and, and bless their hearts. Uh, by it, you know, and, and of course, the business used to be where... You know, all Germans did goose steps, all Asians threw salt and used illegal karate thrusts, all black people had harder heads than anybody else, and all Indians had to perform a war dance. Um, we've gone so politically correct that we get in our own way getting concerned about entertainment. You know, you, you can present a beautiful bigot that is politically incorrect in a movie and get away with it easier than you can in the fiction of a professor wrestling because there's still people that give it more credibility amazingly than a scripted film. And, and look at athletic, look at, you know, the, the athletic comp, you know, uh, athletic commissions all around the United States, they can't make money on, on boxing. And that's how wrestling became a sport. Wrestling became a sport, and, and athletic commissions wanted to regulate it because, well, you know, it looks like a sport, it walks like a sport, it talks like a sport, so we're going to call it a sport. Then Vince McMahon has to go and say, well, it's not, you know, and then we're, you know, you guys are being idiots. Well, no, they just wanted to make money, so even the athletic commissions perpetuate the reality of wrestling. And so wrestling plays under all these really weird and unique rules, which, again, to me, underscores how unique and different and interesting it is. You know, nobody else suffers in the way wrestling does. Wrestling is is a real reflection of modern society in a lot, in a lot of ways and very immediate. Because again, it's improvised. Not everything can be controlled, and not very little is edited on the particularly on the live stuff. And, and before we let you go, I had a, a question because I did some research. Uh, what is your connection with Anarchy Wrestling? Is that your own promotion? As I Anarchy saw had, a couple of things. Anarchy has a diversity. When I went, uh, I closed Wildside in 2005 uh, when I signed with WWE to do development because Vince McMahon thought me working or helping another promotion would be a conflict. And I, I went, okay, I don't see that because, you know, mm -hmm. in essence, we could even feed talent to Deep South because we're right down, you know, we're 60, 75 miles away. But anyway, that was the, their belief. And okay, you no, know, you know, don't argue, take the money. Um, when that happened, uh, some of the guys that were there decided they wanted to keep going, so we transitioned, and I helped them in a transition, do something that was then called, we were NWA Wildside, that became NWA Anarchy, and I continued to sanction that as I was still part of 
that NWA at that time. Um, then the first ownership ended up finding another guy to take over, uh, Jerry Palmer, a local fireman, and uh, he ran it for a while. And once WWE and I parted ways and I went to TNA, I went back there as the booker working with uh, Todd Sexton and Dan Wilson and various other folk to create the, the product. And we've always done television out of the building, so over the past, whatever, since uh, 1999, when I first started promoting there, we've done uh, well in excess of 700 consecutive hours of television out of that building and continue to. And Anarchy continues now with... Um, a uh, gentleman who was a fan and ended up uh, buying out Jerry Palmer when Jerry wanted to get out, uh, Franklin Dove, who's now doing it, and I remained the booker. I left for about a year and, and went down to another place called Rampage Wrestling with now a business where I worked with uh, Jimmy Rave as uh, helping in the booking. And then we came back and we continue. Todd Sexton works with me still. Uh, and we d what we do is we do a television program and the intent of how we do things is to teach wrestlers what they don't get at most shows. Almost everybody puts a camera up and tapes their show. Everybody can do TV now because the cameras are cheap and the editing is easy. Um, but very few people know how you're supposed to work on TV because there's a technique to it. And to be successful in wrestling, you, you have to be successful on television. You, you can't have a mindset where everything you're doing, you're playing to the front row you can't, everything's not going to run 20 minutes. You've got to learn how to take time cues. You've got to find the hard cam. There's an awful lot of stuff you have to learn. So anarchy began, continues, and hopefully will continue until I lose my patience for it um, as a foundation to teach. I'd love it if it drew thousands of people, but the building only holds 200. So, you know, if we get... 60, 70, 80 people in there, it still looks good. If we had 200 in, it looks like we've, you know, sold out Madison Square Garden. <laughs> and we've had a lot of folk run through that building, um, you know, in no particular order. AJ Styles, Ron Killings, Matt Seidel, the, the booker for uh, Ring of Honor, Hunter Johnston, Delirious, came out of that building. Jimmy Rave, Hernandez, Abyss, um... Um, half of the roster of WCW was developed in that building over a period of time. And it just, and most recently, Gunner and um, Xavier Woods, who was Consequences Creed before, and, and we just had Stephen Walters, who is now Dash Wilder, down in, in development. And that's what we're in the business of doing at Anarchy, and that is Anarchy's legacy. It, Anarchy's legacy was inherited from Wildside, and I've, I've been pleased to be involved in that. So it's that's anarchy. Anarchy is a place where young wrestlers learn nobody gets paid anything. Uh, five, ten bucks. That's what people get. And I will proudly say that, and, uh, and they, the talent will grumble it. They can barely buy a hamburger for what we give them, and they all lose money on gas. And some drive, at, drive eight, nine, ten miles. I talk about Matt Seidel and Delirious in the wild side days. They drove from St. Louis once a month. Lost their sh and lost money every single time, but it worked out okay. Both of them became successful and make their living in the wrestling business because they did that. Not just because they came to me, but because they sacrificed and in the process learned. And no one will ever get anywhere only being the place they start in wrestling. You've got to get out of the comfort zone of your home promotion and get somewhere else and work better and different people and learn every place you go. Um, one of the great fallacies is that anyone is trained by one person. doesn't happen that way. One trainer gets you started. Your training then continues until the day you, you retire. And if you don't continue to learn and you don't continue to train, you're going to be a guy that simply puts a T-shirt on over your rapidly growing gut, and you're going to be the guy that shows up and sits in the locker room hiding the beer that they're drinking between matches. And, you know, that's not the professional wrestling business. That's a hobby. And before we let you go, Bill Burns, I appreciate your time with us. Uh, is it okay if we uh, do a little word association with you? Sure. All right, it's not too many uh, names out there, but uh, just a couple. Uh, we'll start off with uh, 
I guess the wrestling god, a lot of people call him, uh, Vince McMahon. Uh, <laughs> he, he is uh, the the best the business has developed within since the early 80s. He revolutionized the professional wrestling business and continues to be a player and continues to challenge everybody in that company and works harder than anyone. Uh, if anyone ever complains about their schedule, no one in WWE until Vince dies will work harder than Vince. It, it's impossible. Uh, the man is a freaking machine. Uh, Matt Seidel or Evan Bourne? Uh, great kid. Uh, amazing body control. Uh, tremendously talented. Uh, an example that you do not have to be six foot five and 250 pounds to be one of the best in the business. AJ would be another example, and there's many, many more. Um, but he proved it at WWE, and as did Daniel Bryan recently. Um, in, and as I've told them for years, in the presence of small people, your medium-sized people are now big, and your big people are now huge. If you only have the cookie cutter six foot two, two hundred and twenty pound guy, then everybody is the same size and nobody stands out. Matt Seidel, Evan Bourne, by the moves he did within the style of WWE, which is a, a slower paced style, he was able to sparkle and become memorable within the time he was there. He made a couple of mistakes and then had a motorcycle accident that nearly ended his career and because he's a hard worker, rehabbed himself and is now back on the indies and is one of the most successful guys out there and is getting very well paid for it. All right, uh, TNA. Thank God they're still around. Uh, and I, I had more fun working there at times than any other place I worked in wrestling, and I hated wrestling more at several times than any other time in my time in wrestling, <laughs> all because of being around TNA. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's... it's the time in Nashville, which was the worst financial time for TNA, was some of the most fun we had, and I went into tens of thousands of dollars of credit card debt doing it. Um, but I loved it. And uh, and most of us that were there at that time have fond memories of it, at least the core of the group that really was the regulars. I mean, the stars that were coming in for a spot here, a spot there, were just there to get paid. Um, I just hope TNA continues. The industry needs TNA. Um They've made a diversity of mistakes, but I don't think they went into them trying to make mistakes. Uh, I just don't think they could help themselves. Uh, uh, Christopher Daniels. Um, AJ still considers him to be the best in the business. Um, and, of course, he and Kaz, as the addiction, their new name and ring of honor, are the best in the busyness. Um, and, and he... Uh, AJ became a star in professional wrestling in a match in 2001 in Florida by cheating and defeating Christopher Daniels, leading to the cameraman on the tape that still exists going, oh my God, what an upset. You look now and you think AJ and Chris Daniels and somehow AJ is the bigger star. AJ will, ne will always think Christopher Daniels and Jerry Lynn will always be better than him. And speaking of AJ, AJ Styles. Best in the business. Um, that, that he was not offered an opportunity at WWE was, was their bad. I understand why, um, but he could have immediately jump-started ratings on television, um, and for a variety of reasons, that was both good and bad for them, so it never happened and never even got close. Um, everybody thought he was making mistakes. Many people thought when he left TNA, it was all a big work that he was coming back, but when he left, he left. And then we went out and didn't know it was going to happen. And now he's the IWGP champion uh, and has been for a period of time. The last guy was Brock Lester, not bad company to be in. And Ring of Honor, he's managed to help them pop the best houses they've had in recent history. And he continues to be well-booked and busy every weekend and doesn't have a date open until next year. And that's only because I don't have New Japan dates yet, so I can't confirm all of the stuff I have uh, on paper through May. So, um, if, you know, the, if the old school of going town to town and drawing houses, the Bruiser Brody kind of thing where mm -hmm. that guy went all over the place, Andre the Giant went all over the place and drew houses everywhere he went, that's AJ in this, in this era. That's awesome for him. That's great. And this has got two more, uh, NXT. 
Uh, next is a is a good idea uh, with a lot of financial uh, and, and the whole development thing. The way Hunter envisioned it and Vince decided to finance it is a gigantic financial gamble. Um, just just huge, and um, and they're they're making it work. They're making it work by forcing themselves to develop from there and bring those people up and do their best to try to get them over and develop talent from the bottom up. Um, and, you know, I said they, they could have brought AJ in and did a lot. Part of the reason they didn't is their development system and what they're trying to accomplish down there. And next is with Terry Taylor as the, the head of the finishing school, um, they, you know, these guys go on to next. They get to work with Terry Taylor, and Terry Taylor teaches them how to be a professional wrestling star. So, and before we do the last one, I got a, a question directly with uh, when it comes to AJ Styles. Do you think he'll ever receive that call from WWE? Do you think there's there's not even a chance? Oh, it, it, it's totally up to them. Um, mm. so it's not something we've rejected. There was never a financial offer that we thought was bad. And uh, are you there? Yes, yes. I had to change phones. This one keeps beeping. Um, oh, sorry. The and this one may be a little weaker, but anyway, there's <laughs> he never. We never really bellied up to that particular bar, and never really had an opportunity presented. Could it come up at some point? Yeah, but it it it's going to have to be fairly soon because you know uh, AJ won't be Hulk Hogan or Ric Flair and uh, lacing the boots and walking much slower than he should uh, down to the ring at 55, 56, 7, 8, 9, 60, 61, 2, you know, and to the point where it can get embarrassing. Um, I, we always wanted, if, to, if, if he had stayed with TNA, our goal was for him to finish up after five more years and become an ambassador for the company. That was what he wanted to do, and they created a an offer that did not allow that to happen from our side. We we couldn't agree to what they believe they needed uh, him to do in terms of taking a hit in the money had been made. You know, mm -hmm. you know, rather than even being paid the same money, they thought he needed a forty percent discount because, as they said, they they made mistakes and had financial difficulties. Um, that was our time to leave, and it wasn't what Alan wanted to do. He he wanted to stay at TNA. But he went out and, and has accomplished more now on his own. Um, you know, the PWI 500 came out, and Daniel Bryan, I guess, is the number one guy. I would have voted for AJ. I don't think anybody else has, has you know, done more without the support of a major company than, than, he than he has. I don't think it's possible to do more, you know. I definitely number one, agree with number you there, one in yeah. Japan and, and a top guy all over the United States. Uh, you know, I don't know how much better you can be. Especially in this era, too. I mean, because WWE is just the monster it is uh, to take the independent um, live, you know, by storm. That, that's awesome for AJ Styles. And, and this is my last one for you, and it's always my favorite. Uh, yourself, Bill Barons. Uh, <laughs> hope, hopefully, I've done more good than bad. Um, and hopefully... The, uh, those that I've helped appreciate that I've helped them and those that have been mad at me uh, understand that maybe I couldn't help them as much as they would have wanted me to. Um, one of the Tommy Dreamer has a great line uh, when uh, that he used when he was in uh, talent relations at WWE and he said what he was being allowed to do is to help people realize their dreams or at least what they thought their dreams were. And that's sort of the double-edged sword of the, the path I've taken. Uh, the successes are few and far between. The number of people that you, you help that actually make it into a live, make wrestling a living is very, very few. It's a, it's a you know, 1%, 5% at the most. I mean, and that's even stretching it. So, you know, it's hard to be called a success, even with the number of people I've, I've been, I helped that have been successful. There's thousands I've interacted in that have never gotten farther than being pretty good on the indies, you know, being a $150 guy. And nobody can work, you know, once a week at $150 and call it a living. So that's, I guess, you know, that's yeah. the downside of it is, uh, 
the good is good. The bad can be very fairly depressing. Um, but the, the times it's good, um, I guess it's the same reason performers perform the, the high of being on stage, the, 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 that aspect of it is the reason you, you deal with the bad part of it. And, and the same is true for me. Hopefully I, I can just continue to help people in a changing business. Um, you can only be as influential as, uh, the people that are in the bigger companies allow you to be. If nobody pays attention to me, then I can't accomplish that much. Uh, and on that note, Bill Burns, it, it's been a pleasure to have you, and, and I thank you so much for your time and your insight. Uh, it was awesome, and I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us here on Main Event Madness. I really do. Appreciate the opportunity, and uh, hope whoever listened enjoyed. All right, thank you, and everyone can visit sbibookings.com and uh, visit his website to go ahead and uh, book some of the, the great talent that he represents. And uh, hopefully much. we can have you again in the future. <laughs> Be pleased to do it. All right, thank you, Bill. Take care. Thank you. All right, folks, on that note, that was Bill Burns. Um, uh, on our show here on Main Event Madness. John, are you there? I am here. That was an awesome interview, guys. Thank you for joining us. I believe that's going to do it here on Main Event Madness. We hope you enjoyed the interview. We hope you enjoyed this inaugural edition of Main Event Madness. we got big plans coming. Like, like we've said, we've got some big interviews coming in the next few weeks. We really hope you guys enjoyed the new format, the new style, and... You guys come back next week when we're back here. We got two shows I believe we're doing next week. We got Karma on Monday, and we have Jim Varcelone of the Miami Herald next Wednesday. All right, that's right, folks. I'm going to get out of here. I got to go check out my eye. It's, like, killing me. So thank you, guys. A lot of love. Main Event Madness. Uh, we're here, and we're here to stay. So thank you, guys. I, I appreciate your support, and I'm signing out. Thank you, John. We'll talk later. Yipper. All right, guys, that's going to do it here. We hope you guys have a great rest of your Wednesday, great rest of your week, and God willing, we'll be back with you next Wednesday. Have a great day, everybody. So long. Hey, hey you. you. Yeah, you. Looking for quality wrestling news with an international flair? Looking for results and news from around the world? Look no further than wrestling-news.net. Wayne Daly and his crew have you covered from top to bottom, from WWE to TNA to the top independent companies from around the world. Check them out, wrestling-news.net. Looking for more than your average wrestling website? Looking for the fastest growing wrestling news site on the internet today? With quality news, results, and more. Wrestling News Report has everything you'd want in a wrestling website. Al Merriman has you covered with the latest and biggest stories of the day from all around the world of pro wrestling. Check them out today, WrestlingNewsReport.com. <laughs> Hear that? That music used to instill fear in women around the world. And now, it instills excitement as former WWE diva and TNA knockout Amazing Khan is coming to Main Event Madness. Join us October 6th for a special Monday edition of Main Event Madness live from 12.30 to 2 p.m. Eastern on Spreaker.com slash Wrestling365. Thank you so much for joining us. Miss a part or all of today's show? No problem. Head over to MainEventMadness.com where you'll find today's show as well as every show in our history. So once again, for all of us here at Main Event Madness, I'm John Curry. Have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you back here next time. Have a good one, everybody. So long. <laughs>